Um, session this morning, if I could ask everybody to find a seat, um, please. Good morning, Mark Wester. We morning. have for the first hour of our working session this morning um, a presentation on or from or about or with um, adult protective services. So, Mark, if you would introduce your guests and get started. Sure. Uh, Good morning, my name is Mark Wester. I'm the director of the Office of Community Access and Independence here at CDHS. Uh, and with me uh, is Mindy Kim. Uh, and uh, she is the division director uh, for adult and aging services, uh, and, uh, which includes uh, adult protective services. And uh, today we are presenting an overview of our adult protective services program and the implications of House Bill 171284. Before I turn it over to Mindy, uh, I wanted to share with you the purpose of uh, House Bill 171284. The intent of the bill uh, was to, quote, minimize the potential for employment of persons with a history of mistreatment of at-risk adults in positions that would allow those persons unsupervised access to these adults. Um, the bill was one of five bills the department uh, sponsored last uh, legislative session. Uh, and um, you know, the, the bottom line, and for those of us who have worked in the IDD or long-term care system uh, for a number of years, know that uh, you know, there were there are cases in which abuse and neglect happens that are just are not positive. And as a result, uh, there's a substantiation and unsubstantiation. And no one knows that that happens except the employer. And so that information has been uh, uh, there's been limited sharing of, of that information. We were became aware of situations where an at-risk adult was mistreated at a facility by a staff person fired by that facility, which is common uh, after uh, such an incident. No criminal investigation or conviction resulted, so the person ended up working at another um, facility with at-risk adults. So that's some of the context behind what this, what uh, House Bill 1284 did to shore up the, the, the gap in that information uh, From my own experience, I've seen examples of this, uh, and it's uh, part of operations, day-to-day -day operations in IDD and long-term care services. Um, we've had, uh, we have some examples to highlight in the presentation, uh, as well as from actual APS cases. So, uh, we really believe it's important for you to understand kind of here's some of the details of some uh, sample cases that um, for whatever reason didn't meet a criminal standard <coughs> could not be prosecuted but still uh, you'll see by the examples were serious uh, the bill was an effort to resolve this by requiring certain employers to request a check of the EPS database before they hire someone who will provide direct care to at-risk adults. We hope this presentation gives you a little more context for the rules. Um, we will be presenting to you later today and over the next uh, couple of months. We also hope it gives you a, a better context of the actual operations of the Adult Protective Services System uh, that is ongoing now in every county across the state. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Mindy and uh, transition. Yeah, please. Absolutely. The yours. Good morning, everyone. We have a bunch of guests today. Um, so I'm excited to be here to share with you a little APS 101. We did a similar presentation actually on um, March 8th for a group of stakeholders. And um, so we're tailoring this a little bit today to things that you might be interested in, but um, this is kind of the, the background of the APS program. 
Um, I know you all probably received the PowerPoint um, and you probably noticed there's a lot of slides here. So I wanted to say up front that there are probably some parts that we'll kind of skip through. I don't think we need to, you know, you don't need to have me read definitions to you and things like that. But we wanted to make sure you had the materials in your packet to reference. And so we'll try and hit on the key points and I'm open to addressing any questions or feedback that you have during the presentation as the state board members. Um, but just know that there's a lot of material here and it's been your reference. That said, um, the APHIS program in Colorado has actually been around since 1983. Um, when it started, it was um, the target population was older adults 65 and older, but then in 1991, the statute was changed to include a definition of at risk adults. Um, which is 18 plus at risk adult standard. We'll talk in a little in a few slides about what that definition is currently for APS. Um, and then of note, in terms of regulation, in 2016, um, the Administration for Community Living adopted federal voluntary guidelines for APS. So some of you may know other programs in the that just have federal requirements. APS does not. There's no federal APS program or funding or anything. It's all each individual state. Um, but there are now these guidelines that give us a little bit of what do other states do in this area? What are best practices? So we often try to refer to those. Um, so there's been some recent state legislation. So even though APS has been in place since 1983, it's changed a lot in recent years because of a couple of key things. Um, so Mandatory reporting was added to the Colorado criminal statutes in two, um, 2014, it was actually 2013, but we started it July 1st, 2014. Um, so what that means is there's certain professionals, it's a very long list, um, healthcare professionals, um, people who work in human services, things like that, that are now required by law to report to law enforcement um, if they observe mistreatment of an at-risk adult. <coughs> And so, in 2014, it was just at-risk elders, which is 70 and older. But then in 2000, uh, July 1st, 2016, that started to include at-risk adults with IDD. Um, and so one thing we wanted to note here is that it's a little confusing because the definitions of who you have to conduct a mandatory report on are different than who we can screen in as an APS client. So you, as a mandatory reporter, you would have to report on somebody 70 or older or an 18 or older with ID. <coughs> However, that doesn't necessarily mean that APS is going to screen that case in. So if you're capable of making decisions, of getting services in place, just because you're 70 doesn't mean APS is going to take you on as a case. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about the screening and process, but... <coughs> and then the other change that Mark mentioned that, to open this up is the CAPS check bill. That was a, a bill that passed last legislative session. The department was very involved in advocating for that, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that again. Um, and so this is the actual language from statute related to mandatory reporting. Um, again, I just wanted to hear from your reference that it's observing the mistreatment of an at-risk elder or at-risk adult with IVD and reasonable cause to believe that that person has been mistreated or is in imminent risk. And again, it gets a little, little tricky, but statute um, requires the mandatory reporter to report to law enforcement. They can also call APS if they want to, but they're not required by law to. However, it does require law enforcement to transfer that report, to basically forward that report, the information from that report, to APS within 24 hours. And then if for some reason APS gets a report um, that doesn't go to law enforcement, they have to forward that to them within 24 hours. It's a little tricky. And then again, for your reference, here is the, the legislative declaration from House Bill 171284. So you can see that the language in here really talks about um, protecting vulnerable adults. And that was the intent of, of that bill. Um, 
Any questions so far on the state board on this? Maybe just jumping back one slide. Sure. Um, the requirement is that the mandatory report be made to law enforcement. Does law enforcement first decide whether or not there is a level of criminality that warrants their investigation before passing it on to APS, or does that pass on to APS happen irrespective of law enforcement's evaluation as to criminality? That's a great question. So they are just required to, to forward the report. They're not, they're not supposed to assess it or determine. So because it could be an either and or situation, um, it could be something they choose to investigate criminally or not. It could be something that APS would screen in or not, but um, regardless, they're just required to pull in the report. That's interesting to me because I. Um, <clears throat> why then, if you know, you may not know when you write the bill, right. um, why then does the call not just go to APS from the mandatory report? Why first to law enforcement, if you know? I have a little sense, it's a little um, speculation, but I think there were some advocates in the law enforcement and DA community that really wanted the report to go to law enforcement first to give them the opportunity so that they would get all mandatory reports right and they would see them all. And then they would have the opportunity to decide whether or not they were going to screen it. And it still required them to send it to APS, but they wanted them. So there, there's two main parts of this, and we're going to obviously get into this when we talk about the rule packet later, but the first part of the CAPS check bill is requiring the CAPS check, starting January 1st um, of 2019, all a certain group of employers will have to request a check from us in our CAPS database uh, when they're hiring somebody who's going to do direct care with at-risk adults um, to see if that person's been substantiated in an APS case. That's that's the big piece. The other big piece that we're, we have in Rule Packet 2 that you'll hear this afternoon or later today is the due process. So in order to do these CAPS checks, we need a due process system in APS that we don't currently have. Um, and so I know you heard about that last month, um, but that's those are the two main pieces of this. Um, we wanted to provide for you a few examples of um, substantiated treatment treatment in APS case by care providers that work in facilities. So you can get a sense of, you know, once due process is effective, these people will have due process rights. And then once those CAPS checks are effective, if one of these people, you know, in these types of situations apply for a job at a facility, um, information on their substantiation would be provided to that employer when they request the check. Um, so an example of physical abuse is a care provider who intentionally branded an at-risk adult as a bunch of tongs, causing severe burns and scarring. An example of caretaker neglect, a care, uh, care provider was intoxic intoxicated while transporting um, clients with IDD and was arrested for a, a DUI while the clients were in the vehicle. So these are the things that are happening out there in our facilities, in our communities across Colorado. Um, it's not frequent. There are many wonderful people that work with our vulnerable adults, right? We have thousands and thousands. These are very rare circumstances, but they do happen. And so that's sort of underscoring the intent of the CAPS check bill, to make sure that when a provider is hiring somebody to do the very important work of working with Atmos adults, that they have this information. The CAPS check will not get this level of information, so I know you're probably saying, oh wow, that's a lot of information to give the employer. Um, you'll, you'll hear that next month and we'll pack it free. Um, but essentially, all the information the employer would get is um, the date of the finding, um, the county in which it was located, whether it was physical abuse, caretaker neglect, or exploitation. Um, so I think that's basically and, the, and if you pass the severity levels today, it would be severity level. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about APS generally. Um, as you know, it's a state supervised county administered program, um, similar to several other programs. I'm sorry if I yeah. you off. No, no. Uh, so, with respect to uh, 
So under that physical abuse, it says a care provider. Is there, is that um, some kind of sanctioned provider, or is that a uh, you know family member who was you know in charge of taking responsibility? But from the family perspective, in charge of caring for that adult. Right. So these are all examples from um, people who are working for a facility okay, or agency. Gotcha. But I um, see this is possible to happen. In and in order to happen in the family contents context, yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot about the yeah. employer scenario, but in a family context, it would still get sent through the system, it just wouldn't be in the employer side of it, correct? I mean, it would be reported by it to the police, the police report it to local APS, and then the local APS would do their investigation, etc. This right. wouldn't necessarily go through the tax system. Um, so the, it would still, me, the employer part of it. Right, so it would still be in the tax system if it was substantiated, uh, it would be in there, and then if for some reason, you know, three years from now that person decided, oh, I want to work in a facility, it would still be there. Okay. So even though it didn't happen in a in that context, it would still get caught. Right, thank you. Okay, so state role. We do all the program policy, oversight, monitoring, quality assurance, technical assistance type stuff. Um, we have a pretty small group to do this with. Um, so our APS staff, um, Peg Rogers, is here, manager of that unit. And then um, we have some specialists and staff that help support our data system, um, work directly with counties, provide technical assistance to them, do all their training. Um, so there's seven of us here at this building that do that for the whole state. And then we also have Mark Mackert with us in the back of the room. And Mark um, oversees the Administrative Review Division, and they have just received funding this year for quality assurance staff specific for the APS program. Um, so they kicked off their reviews um, I think last month. Yeah. Um, and they, they have some designated staff. Well, I'd like to ask a question on that. Sure. Also, as it relates to APS, state APS staff, do those staff typically have some experience in um, a county APS uh, system as well? Great question. Um, we really look for that when we're hiring folks to do our policy and training work, and also by help with the quality assurance staff, they look for that. It's not a requirement, right? Because um, so many people learn the program, but it's, um, I'm pretty sure everyone we have on our staff, not everyone. So two of my specialists were case workers in the APS program, um, one from Denver County, one from uh, Arapahoe County, and then the third person has had um, a decade of experience uh, in the IBD system at a community center board. Yeah, so it's, it's, <coughs> High on our list, but it's not a deal breaker. Okay, um, in terms of our state quality assurance, we have been doing quality assurance, obviously, of the APS program and the county's administration of it for a long time. Um, it's in our rules, and we do it on the state level a couple of different ways. We look at specific target measures, so for example, are they meeting all their training requirements? Are they screening in cases appropriately? Um, we also in front here, you have formal case reviews or even consults on cases. Um, and then we obviously have CSTAT measures for those of you who are in the CSTAT process. Um, but now ARD has taken on the, the role of formal quality assurance in each county. So they're going to try and hit every county um, for a year's time, give or take a little bit. And, um, and we've done a few counties so far. It's, it's been very successful. I think that's a good feedback to the counties. What's your C stat target <clears throat> and how have you been scoring? Sure. So one of one of the measures for C stat is timeliness of monthly contact. Um, so our rules state that um, a caseworker needs to see a client once a month. Um, we have just increased our goal on that measure statewide to ninety five percent from ninety percent. And we're hovering around 94, we've hit 95 a few months. So for the most part, caseworkers are seeing, you know, clients once a month, like re required by the rule. We do, do dive in if there is a county or a caseworker who has, you know, a significant amount that they haven't seen. We kind of dive into that data for, um, to see if there are any issues and 
we typically find it's things like they've made multiple attempts to see the client and the client wasn't there, or sometimes the client has passed away because we're dealing with elderly folks um, and they just didn't close the case in time so it gets captured in that data, things like that. And what was the impetus to talk behind moving the, the goal up? Um, so we were at 90% we were hitting it every month. Um, and most counties are hitting it on their county level. And so um, Reggie likes the challenge, as you all know. And so he challenged us and you know, the counties to be hitting 95%. Um, so that's where we're at. And if I can jump in, part of the context behind that is if our role is to make sure we see clients in those safety measures in place, we want to be timely in that and as close to perfect as we can. So if, if it turns out that like you're always going to, 94 is the best you're going to be able to do because 5% of the people have passed, I mean, if that's always your, mm -hmm. the, if that's always why case, cases aren't being met, it just seems like having an achievable goal is different than just setting a higher goal, I guess. Mm -hmm. And we have, we have hit the 95 a couple of times. I don't know off the top of my head, but so it's a, it's achievable. Um, it's just you know some months um, there's more of those situations than other. That's why we don't make the goal 100 percent because we know that there's going to be situations like that. So just one clarifier: um, when you talk about customer contact, in the context of this particular set of issues in PMS and the caps, is there some special expectation that you've made or that you're contemplating making vis-a-vis -vis, um, folks who have been subject to the victims of mistreatment? I'm a little confused. Maybe I jumped down a rabbit hole and you guys are still going straight, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to sort out the relationship of what all of it you just said with the APS. Sure. I think it will become a little more clear as we talk about the life of the APS and Understanding and capacity to make or communicate responsible decisions. 
regarding their personal reporters. So this is what I was referring to earlier as a mandatory reporter needs to report uh, suspected mistreatment of someone seven years older, for example, that was elder. They may not meet this definition. So that report will go to law enforcement, law enforcement will forward it to APS. APS still has to do the work of determining if this is an at-risk adult. If it's not an at-risk adult for this definition, they screen the case out. It doesn't become, or the report out, it doesn't become a case. Um, so now you kind of understand the difference between a report, when a report is made, and then whether or not that's screened in and it becomes a case. A case is when an investigation is done, an assessment is done. Um, so here's some data. Um, as you can see, we've trended up a lot because of military reporting. Um, so the blue is the reports we've received in each of the past few fiscal years, and the red are the cases that we've opened in the last few fiscal years. <coughs> Curious, um, how many of the how many of the cases are people that are in fact 65 or older? How many of the cases are people below that age? Um, so we have a slide on that a little bit, but I uh, okay. about 70. Let's wait till that slide. to those that are getting screened in is changing a little bit. So before mandatory reporting, um, we had about 50 to 60 percent of the reports actually got screened in became the case. That's lower now. That's closer to 37 percent of getting screened in. Because when you require somebody to report, there's that tendency to over-report, right, like just in case. So we are getting um, statewide, you'll hear from counties often, that they get some reports that just don't rise to the level of becoming a case. Okay, here's, here's some client risk factors, again, for your reference. Um, these are the types of things that um, are conditions that make somebody um, susceptible for mistreatment or neglect. And you can see some of, the, some of the bigger conditions that are part of this is older adults, particularly who are medically fragile, um, frail elderly, and those with dementia and Alzheimer's are big contributors to, to our at-risk adults. So, so, Mindy, if I could just clarify for the board, these are the reasons that they would screen in or define it as an at-risk adult, right? Um, so there, yeah, it's a little more nuanced down. They're contributing factors. So again, you can have somebody with very early stages of dementia or Alzheimer's, and they're fully, they don't meet that at-risk <coughs> definition. They're fully capable of still caring for themselves. So we wouldn't screen that in. But as you get into more advanced levels of dementia and Alzheimer's, that's when they become meet the definition. This this slide puzzles me. Is this the, the predominant or most significant factor? Because especially with the elderly, you hit dementia, uh, frail elderly, uh, med medically fragile, physical impairment. They may they may be six of these things. Right. So, but it adds up to 100%. Exactly. It adds up to 110. What? I'm sorry. I'm going to have to talk to our data first. Oh, I may have missed another, so I'll shut up. Right, so somebody can have, um, in fact, about um, almost half of our clients with, um, for APS have two or more of these risk factors. So this is? The 100%. This is the number one factor. Um, no, these are all the factors. So if you were to take, all the all the conditions, and then <coughs> divide them up. So somebody could be counted twice in here. That's yeah. I know. That's true. Yeah, no, you, you, you. <coughs> okay. Again, I'll hear you. I knew it was coming up. Um, so as you can see here, 18 to 59 is 25 percent. So about 75 percent of APS clients are over age 60. And that 18 to 59 includes folks like um, individual with a brain injury or early onset Alzheimer's or an adult with IBD. So it's a variety of different things. <laughs> and then you can see our APS clients um, last year were a little more female um, represented than male. 
And then the, there's about 18% of HS clients are living in a facility, so that would be like a nursing home. But a lot of, a majority of them are actually in the community, living around And when you see the data a little bit on um, this slide or two, up on South Neglect, you realize that um, a good number of our HS cases are actually self neglect. So that's, that's typically your older adult living in your own home. A neighbor calls to make a report. I'm worried about Susie. She was fine a couple months ago. She's starting to fail. You know, so on the uh, um, client living arrangements, uh, graph, I find uh, pretty upsetting, honestly, that one out of five reports of abuse or uh, maltreatment come out of care facilities. Who is that a who supervises that or who's which department oversees facilities and or does it depend on what the facility is? It does. Um, typically C D P H E oversees um, things like nursing home places of living. Buff has authority over some types of facilities C D H S does. Yeah. If I can um, kind of underscore some of that. So the licensed facility licensed by the state of Colorado. Normally, that is licensed through um, public health and environment. Um, and then, if, for instance, like IDD providers, um, like host homes and uh, personal care alternatives and uh, day services are not licensed by CDPHG, that they're overseen by health care policy and finance through the Division for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And so, um, that's their oversight. Uh, Long-term care, of course, is overseen both um, federally as well as CDPHG. ICF programs are also have federal regs, uh, and CMS has oversight. And uh, also the state regs also apply in their license. So there's uh, pretty strict reporting requirements for a licensed facility. Um, and uh, and in the IDD system, the, the reporting goes to CCDs and over to healthcare policy science. So, what's the goal for that? Well, this one of the things. I mean, that, is, are the metrics you say? I mean, is eighteen percent the right number of? I mean, is it inevitable that you're going to have eighteen percent of your uh, cases coming out of? I may mean, not use the word cases technically correctly, but you know. The purpose of that slide is it the right number that 18 percent should be coming out of facilities that are designed to protect people and take care of them. And this is our experience, like this is actual data. Am I correct? Right, and just just, just to clarify on that point, so um, we'll talk a little bit about the report um, report screening process. So we, at the county level, the APS staff, all they do is take their reports, decide whether or not to screen it in. If they screen it in, they check. So we don't have any control over, you know, the facilities or anybody out right. in the world of what, what happens. We are just responsible in these gaps for responsible <coughs> I would say, you know, philosophically, it's since mandatory reporting has started, um, you have seen an increase in reports and you've seen an increase in cases. So it may be a good thing that people are reporting more or, you know, that those are, those are getting investigated by APS. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily say we want numbers to go down, right? Because that could actually mean that people are just not reporting. Sure. I'm just, but my, I mean, it strikes me that one out of five, uh, is this quantifying reports or is this quantifying cases? Cases. So it still strikes me. That some, so case is, is, so it is, is more of a sign of a problem than a report. Right. It still strikes me as one out of five before one out of five cases comes out of an institution that's responsible for taking care of these people. Seems like too high a number to me. Okay. And this is only licensed facilities. No. It says facility. Okay, so yeah, it says facilities. That's why I was clarifying this. This is licensed facilities and non licensed like host home and IDD care providers. So it's a fine distinction, like a licensed facility would be an IDD group home that is licensed by CDPHE and also overseen by a provider. But there are a number of 
services being provided that are not, they are program approved services through healthcare policy and finance, but they're not licensed by CDP. And we could, um, so we can keep moving, we can get you the data on what. I don't need to know the data. I'm yeah. just saying, yeah, yeah, that seems wrong. Right. That seems too hot. And, and, and I understand it's not you're just you're just right. reporting, right. but from a state level, right. that seems too hot. And, and that's what this caps check bill tries to capture is that number of those cases that don't reach a criminal standard. And when you think about an IDB uh, individual or a dementia uh, patient, it's very hard to interview the client at times, then are you going to make them take the witness stand? You, you know, there's a lot of challenges to the criminal aspect, of it, but at the same time, facilities for a long time, uh, and ATS workers know, can establish, did it more likely or not happen? And that's what substantiation is. Yeah, it's more likely that it happened than it did. And that's, that's what we're trying to capture and as it, in kind of the provider world, you know, you're constantly looking at this and trying to make sure that your your clients are safe and monitoring your staff so that things don't happen, that they still incidents like like the examples we shared do happen. Mark, what's the number? What's about the, the actual number of high cases last year? I'll defer to Mandy. So, in the interest of time, I am going to kind of go through and skip over the definitions, but again, they are there for your reference. And these are um, directly from the statute. So, mistreatment, when we talk about mistreatment in the ATS um, program, it means um, abuse caretaker neglect or exploitation but then as you saw a large um, number of our cases are actually not neglect as well so uh, are we to use, and um, i wanted to highlight some of our key principles in the APS program uh, we talk about these a lot in training with APS staff they're, they're very important um, this is one of the areas where you'll see a distinction between um, sort of other protection programs like child welfare and APS. Um, and so obviously confidentiality, these are adults. Um, they are at-risk adults, they're still adults. Confidentiality is, is, is very important. The statutes for APS confidentiality are um, pretty stringent. Um, and the statutes only require, only allow um, information on APS to be shared. Um, without a court order, or court order under very specific circumstances. So typically, you would need a court order to get information on APS case. And I know we've talked about with this, this group before. Um, so consent. Um, adults who have capacity to understand the decision have the right to refuse. We can offer protective services, but they can not It would seem that there would be a lot of subjectivity in terms of consent. Does everybody do that the same way? Sorry. Yes, so the caseworkers, it's um, contingent on the case, of course, but caseworkers look at um, that person's orientation. Uh, if they're able to hold a conversation, make decisions, things are organized, they can balance their checkbook. There are some screening tools like the slums, the mocha, the clocks that. APS caseworkers can use to kind of screen if they're kind of like thinking there may be some issues. They'll uh, get medical records from doctors to see whether or not doctors are seeing any signs of compromised um, cognitive function. Um, and then they can also have that person evaluated by a professional to have a professional psych about them. And then self-determination is also um, kind of an offshoot of consent. Um, so um, adults who do accept uh, protective services, they still have the right to decide which ones they want to receive. So we can go into a house where, you know, um, there's self-neglect happening, there's a lot of uh, mess or things like that. We can offer, hey, we can have somebody come out, and you know, okay, I want them to do the house, and they cannot help you clean this up. And we can also take this furniture away. And they can say, 
I'll well, take the help cleaning up, but you're leaving the furniture. You know, those type of things. So um, that's a key principle in, in the work of the new case worker. And then finally, like we call least restrictive intervention. Um, and this is in our rules that um, we really want to provide the least intrusive services uh, for the client. And so we should also intervene for the shortest amount of time possible. Can I just uh, ask a question, Thomas? You get your uh, question answered relative to consent. Okay. I just wanted to underscore that that last slide was that's the philosophy and the priorities that drive APS work in the state. So self-determination, consent. If someone says, get out of my life, I don't want you here, they're out the door, right? They, they don't intervene. Least restrictive environment, least restrictive intervention, very consistent with person-centered uh, care and principles, and um, and so it's a delicate balance that caseworkers walk between. Hey, we we're concerned about you. We want to make sure that you're safe, and we want to put systems that uh, services in place that are going to make you safer. But we also want to respect your dignity of person and dignity. Bindi, what how long is does, is the average length of a case? <coughs> Great question. So I always get the stats when we do the birth thing, but the majority of cases are close within three months. <coughs> about eighty-two percent are close within three months. Um, about ninety-five percent are close within six months, and ninety-nine percent are close within a year. Is, is there a, is there a, I don't know who to ask, is there a standard for that internally or externally? There isn't, except for um, sort of based on those principles, in, you know, least restrictive intervention, things like that. Um, and then we do have some some stuff in our rules that's um, pretty much when you when you put services in place, close the case. You know, so that there's no sort of set. Okay, at three months you have to close this or anything. But based on the principles and the guidelines and the rules, that's just how it works out. And if I can interject, the caseworker is going to look at, once they get services put in place, they're going to spend a couple weeks um, with that client still to make sure that those services are addressing the issue. And then when they know that those, yes, those, that's fixing the issue, it's a bad thing for them to close the case. And I may be jumping ahead, I apologize. Um, how, do, how do those data overlay onto your process map and the timing that's articulated around your process? care providers. So, well, so, the, so, sorry. so the rule sort of contemplates a set of time frames that these are decision points, go, no, go, around the due process elements. Right. How do those timelines that you're experiencing with current cases interact well or not well with the due process timelines that you look at? Yeah. Um, I'll try. Okay. <laughs> Don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> I try. <not> <laughs> um, so when when the, the only sort of key interaction point between an APS case and then when the due process is when when a finding is made um, is when that will initiate the due process. When, once the finding is made, substantiated. And that will, based on the work I'm hearing later today, that will trigger the county to send a notice to the substantiated perpetrator to say you have due process rights, here's the finding that's been made for you, um, here's how to appeal it if you want to. That's really the only kind of interaction between, you know, at the end of this one we included a flowchart on how a case works because we wanted to walk you through that. Then you also received a flowchart on due process and how that works. The only kind of main interaction point is when a finding is made in APS, then that will trigger the due process. You may get to this later in your presentation. But to me, this is the point at, at which the, the angst and discussions have been going on for the last several months happen. Put your screen in if the allegations are substantial. They're screened out. If they are not substantiated. Substantiated is, is that not correct? No, no. Okay. <coughs> Let me 
let me walk you through this slide, and then, and yeah. then I think we'll. we'll have that, to that's where I'm trying to get my mind around it. Yep. Is that term is a little different than I'm used to. Right. Uh, I'm not sure how the subsequent process is evaluated to determine whether the substantiation was in fact accurate. Right. Too me, good or too bad. Let me breeze through, breeze through these next several slides because we'll walk through the case. And then if it's not clear, then we'll do questions. How's that? Okay. Okay. So when a report is made to APS, either it comes in from an individual making a report or it comes over from law enforcement, we either screen it in or screen it out. Um, and so if it gets screened in, it has to be an at-risk adult for that definition. And there has to be a reason to believe that there's mistreatment or self-neglect. Um, so it can't be, hey, I stepped back, accidentally stepped on grandma's toe, I'm calling in a report because I mistreated her. Um, that doesn't meet the definition of mistreatment, so we would screen it out. Um, once it's screened in, it will become a case, and that's when we do an investigation, an assessment, and do some case planning. If it's screened out, then um, the county can still refer them to other resources and services within the community. So maybe just a comment. This is even um, this is even less than sort of like a probable cause determination. This is just do the allegations even fit our portfolio of what we do? Or is this a case that some other agency would have to investigate? It's not even determining the likelihood of the allegations being true. It's just do the allegations fit the bucket that we happen to work on? Thank you. I'm going to use that because that was good. <laughs> 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 uh -oh. Can I also uh, make a quick comment? There's two aspects of it. One is the investigation of who's is there someone actively harming an at-risk adult? That's the investigation piece. The, the case planning, in, uh, let me look at, yeah, the assessment and case planning is how do we increase the safety for that at-risk adult, right? What can be put in place? So, for instance, it may be, hey, it may be engaging a family member, it may be addicts and services, in-home caretaker services, those kind of things. So there's kind of two aspects. One is social working. The other one is what really happened here, and is it substantiated or not? So a substantiation would be a subset of screened in, in cases, right? There would be some that are unsubstantiated, screened in cases and some that are substantiated in the investigation portion. And that's what we're going to get to next. Um, so the next couple of slides are actually what Ted said. Um, we look at what happened and we look at information about the adult in deciding whether or not to screen the case in. Um, we did want to point out, because I've, I've heard a couple of comments in the community recently, does APS go out and do a survey of facilities or random inspections of facilities? That's not our role, right? Like, there are other state agencies that oversee licensed facilities, things like that. Um, we, at APS, at the county level, just take the reports and do our, do our work with them. Do you have any obligation to, upon taking the reports, go... Wow, something's going on at XYZ facility, and then ask for the other agency to do an inspection. Yes, um, you you are like getting right to our next step. As part of the investigation, we can conduct joint investigations. So, um, like with CDPG or other other entities. Yeah. Um, and so again, this is an overview of what the caseworkers do during an investigation. They interview a variety of people. Um, typically, they don't announce their visits, but um, there are exceptions to that. Um, and typically, they try and interview um, the client or at-risk adult alone. But again, if, if um, the at-risk adult requests to help somebody else there, we can do that too. 
The goal is really to get as accurate. It's, it's an investigation to find out what happened, right? And we can't make a, a thorough and complete finding without kind of getting to the bottom of what happened. Um, and then we also look at, um, the caseworker would look at a variety of different documents as applicable. And this is where it's conducted jointly. It could be the CCB um, or CPAG or law enforcement that they're working collaboratively with. And then once the investigation is complete, this is where um, I think we were getting to a little bit earlier, is that the caseworker then evaluates all the evidence they've collected and determines whether the allegations, there's two things, the allegations, were they substantiated, unsubstantiated, or inconclusive? Um, so once the investigation and all that information is done and collected, that's when they make that. And the level of evidence in APS is a preponderance of evidence. And that's the same as it is in child welfare. It's the same as it is in the majority of other APS programs in the country. And it's also the same level of evidence as many other civil um, standards in, in Colorado. Um, and so at this point, the rules only require, and we'll hear about this later, um, that the findings are discussed with the APS supervisor. But what we've included with the packet you have to remain in today is that all findings will be approved by the supervisor before they're finalized. Um, and that's sort of an additional measure or control that we wanted to put in the rule to make sure that, um, you know, there is somebody sort of confirming those findings and taking a look at that information. Um, so there is some data that we've included on what the findings actually look like, and this may be of interest to you uh, because not all cases that are investigated are substantiated, right? There are some that are inconclusive or some that are, are unsubstantiated. So of all the allegations last year, um, you can see the, the breakout of which ones, you know, how many were caretakers who had um, physical abuse and exploitation. And then there's also self neglect in here. Now, I will point out because we've gotten this question recently oh, do you make a finding and substantiate on a person for self neglecting? Are they the, the you know, alleged perpetrator? We don't have that in APS. We obviously are not going to tell somebody you've self neglected and you know, you've been substantiated against yourself. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's not um, a thing that we do. But what this is saying is of the original allegation, was it you know, preponderance of evidence that it's substantiated or not. So uh, I'm trying to trying to make sure I know what the difference in a report and an allegation in a case is. Mm -hmm. Is an allegation like a report or is it another category yet? Exactly. So when a report <laughs> is made, somebody can um, they can make several allegations. You know, I think this person is self reflective but I also think there's caretaker neglect, and I also think there's expectation, right? right. Yeah. So the allegations are what they're saying is happening when they make the report. So I was just trying to do some numbers, so I can't automatically say there were 20,000 reports, so now, now I'm using the math and say how many sexual abuse allegations there were. Got Don't, but if we may have some of that in our annual report. I forget the numbers. Well, uh, and, and so use your, Julie, to use your frame. Okay, there were 9,100 cases screened in. So the percentages here would be relative to that number. Well, yeah. In terms of substantiation, these are substantiation, so you have to go even further. Right, so, so if one, one case has three whatever the, exactly. That's right, out of 9,100, whatever. It's a new, it's a new category. Yeah, yeah. That's, so, yeah that's, sorry. That's, we have lots of that's okay, I was packets. just trying to do it in my head. Right. It wouldn't be a waste of time. So, yes. Okay, now I'm, I'm getting confused again. Sure. Which is hard. Um, okay. We've got, we've turned out with 9,000 allegations. Uh, the, the language on the right hand side says 32% of all allegations were substantiated. So Do you have that. a number that, of allegations? Because <laughs> that's a different category. Oh, right. So, so um, 
about there is an average of 1.2 allegations per case. Hey, so while there's 9,000 cases, there could be 10,000 allegations attached to those cases because the case could have multiple. You could have someone who is alleged to be neglecting and exploiting. Sure, I get that. So when you're looking at the allegations data, we're looking at the total allegations, not the number of reports, not the number of cases. Okay, but I would ask the question, the total number of cases open? Was about 9,000 last year. Was about 9,000. How many of those was one or more allegations substantiated? I don't know the number. I just know that it's approximately 1.2 allegations per case when we average it out. Okay. So a question, and then something that might help uh, Mr. Pusher. Um, how many of the, so the 9,000 cases that were screened in, how many referrals or reports, I should say, yeah. were made that year? About 20,000. Okay, so out of 20,000 people calling APS, that resulted in 9,000 cases being opened, involving about 10,000 allegations. The 32% applies to that 10,000 number, right? right? So, and that, and that could be, in a single case, one allegation might be substantiated and another allegation might not be substantiated. Correct. So they found, yeah, the, the, the caretaker neglected them, but they weren't exploiting them. They, you know, they, they, they were lazy, but they didn't um, actually, like, go through their finances and steal money. So a single, that's why we look at allegations um, versus cases being substantiated, because it can involve of both the unsubstantiated and substantiated. If I could follow up then, the 32% applies to the 10,000 some odd total allegations, meaning that, and, and that 32% could include two allegations against one single situation. Yes. So, so it seems like the, of the 9,000, cases that were originally open, something in the range of 3,000 go forward. Are substantiated and yes. would be reflected, yes. That's what I'm trying to get yeah, at. So this is, this is dangerously extrapolative, but yes. just punch yeah. in my calculator with the benefit of Peg's numbers. The top of the funnel is 20,000 strong, that's what you said, right? right. That results okay. in 9,000 cases yeah. at 1.2 allegations per case, it's 10,800 allegations, of which 3,456 of 34,500 are substantiated. And then I those are the, those are, I mean, it's extrapolative, so take for what then, it's worth, but those are the numbers. And then let's skip, I think, to where you're going with this next is, right, maybe so then, before you do that, yeah. let me that, just for the sake of the board, um, uh, Alicia was kind enough to, to recognize that this is good, rich conversation. We do have another presentation that we're going to, in fact, postpone. Um, that was the competency and restorations conversation with Dr. Fox and, and Robert Worthwine. Uh, Dr. Fox and Dr. Worthwine, in fact. Um, so um, we can continue going into this. I think this is good, rich conversation. It's certainly educational for me, so we're just going to keep on. So. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I like the group math thing. <laughs> um, and so, so we got to, um, you know, how many allegations um, were substantiated. So that's where we left off. This breaks it down a little further. And so, what we do is we also identify um, for each the number of perpetrators that were alleged perpetrators where a finding was substantiated on them. Um, and this is what's going to play into those caps checks. So if you look at the, the pie chart up in the um, right side, um, this is the relationship to the client. So 25% were agency or professional, a large number were family members, some were community members. And then if you're looking at this statistic of the number, of, of the 25% of people who were alleged um, to be treated in that risk result, 25% uh, were substantiated. So a large number of those cases, what this means is we open the, the case, 
So if the report is made, we open the tapes, the caseworker does the investigation, and there are many times, a, a high number of times, when it's actually unsubstantiated or inconclusive. So not every time an investigation is opened is the, then the individual, um, does it become a substantiated finding. So I'm curious if we have this uh, kind of broad and multifaceted um, uh, framework around at risk, right? So if it's elder, some of it is um, medically compromised, and other and then I think is that their general category of IDD. Is that, is that correct? Um, or if I try to. So we, um, I'm going to always bring us back when it when it's concerning APS to that at-risk adult definition that yes. we included. That um, I can never quote it exactly right, um, but that is the only criteria for APS screening of abuse. So that could in, could include somebody with an adult with IDD, um, a very elderly person, you know, the whole the whole range of vulnerable adults. Yes. Um, but. Um, just because somebody meets one of those criteria or has one of those conditions doesn't mean they meet the at-risk adult definition. Okay. So maybe more of the question that I, I think I'm driving to is I'm curious if you've done any significant um, breakdown between um, if, if you if you look at either um, the substantiated allegations or the alleged perpetrator, if you see any um, huge outlying data set that, that correlates family members with ID. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Right. Is there any trends that we really that are worthy of digging into and either modifying school policy, or is this Pretty straightforward. Any way you slice it, it's pretty standard. So we we haven't. Um, it's a good question. We haven't been able to slice and dice the data like that. Um, but I think it's something that you know, people will make a note of. Is um, you know I, I kind of see what your question is. Is is uh, is there a relationship between um, the risk factors for the individual and the um, sort of mistreatment? In the type of you know, perpetrator or facility or category, right. we haven't gone there yet. Um, but but yeah, you think you were interpreting what I was trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> but I'd like, like to interject a little bit because this yeah. bottom graph kind of shows that um, it's not in the level of detail that I think you might be thinking about. But if you look, this is the rate of substantiation by the relationship of that perpetrator to the client. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at like the DD system, 42% of the alleged perpetrators who worked in that DD system were substantiated last year. And so we do have some relationship data yeah. around populations and who's doing the, the mistreating, just not quite in the detail that you're looking for. And when, when you say DD system, you're talking about Direct home, care workers, CCPs, people working in a group home, people process, working at a case manager. Okay. Yeah. It seems surprising to me that that number can be so high. I'm just going to say, so who is unknown that you're just going to tell me? I don't know. <laughs> so, and again, this is saying of, of the um, public sphere relationship that we identify as unknown, 29% um, of those are substantiated and the other person are not. So it's not saying that the, this isn't showing the percentage of these that are unknown. Oh, and un, um, sorry. So it is actually a small number. That it's smaller number. It's 5%. Oh, okay. Uh, but so that would be things mm -hmm. like a, a, a financial scam, right? Um, we would never know who the perpetrator is um, in that. Like or something. Right. Oh, All right. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or <laughs> I know. Someone sees something on the screen. Uh, physical abuse, and the person runs off, and we can't locate that person. So we can. So, yeah. 
is, uh, this may be something that everybody's already on the same page on, but because I'm a math major, I am very strongly about statistics. So the top graph is showing that of the people who were substantiated for a um, for an allegation, the, the predominant um, category of those are family members. So of people who are committing uh, mistreatment of at-risk adults, most of them that have been substantiated are family members. But 42% is is a an allegation against a DD system advocate is the most likely to be um, upheld. So that doesn't mean there are, are a lot of reports against them. It just means of the ones that are reported, most of those turn out to be supported by the evidence. Right. So that could be like five reports and like um, three of them were substantiated. Um, it doesn't mean that that's the outside, that's the driving uh, relationship that we'll kind of stream out. Thomas was I appreciate that, uh, Pat, because in, as, a, as a provider, one of the reasons for that is usually you provide care and there's systems and people around you monitoring your care. So there's two other staff in the group home or uh, there's a, you know, there's a system built around protecting yeah, it, it doesn't mean that the DB system is bad. It means that the DB system is remarkably effective at reporting only pretty good cases to ABS. Right now. data for a while and know this has been really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, another very important part of an ABS is the assessment. Um, now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today because it's not the most relevant thing to the rule package we'll be considering, but please know that this piece is very important. This is where we figure out what's going on with this individual and what do they need and how can we help. This is the social work um, piece. This is our case workers are, are excellent and not only assessing but putting services in place for these people. Um, so we actually have an assessment tool in the class that was um, validated, scientifically validated with the Health Health Review last year. Um, and it's basically a tool that the um, caseworker will use to identify what are the risk factors, are there any mitigating factors that are um, helping to alleviate that, um, sort of where does this person stand when they first open the case. And you can again, happy to talk further about that, but for today I'm just going to kind of gloss over this a little bit. Um, and then there are certain factors within each assessment area. Um, so an example of a risk factor that would be mitigated is a person with some ambulatory impact that they're unsteady on their feet. They would be safer with a cane or walker. Um, so if they already had a cane or a walker, we would just note that, that yes, they have an unsteady gait, but they have a cane or a walker. And, and what the assessment does, um, even though it's it's kind of scorecardy and things like that, is it gives us a general sense of what does this person need. And that directly ties into case planning. Um, and so these are, again, some um, some of our key principles showing up in the case planning process that we're doing the least restrictive intervention, that this is based on consensual determination. And then we also wanted to point out that um, some of you are familiar with Child Welfare, again, and other programs, that they actually have money and services that they can access. If yes, why not? We heavily rely on the services available in the community other programs and supports. Um, so a lot of times what APSG is doing is um, coordinating and, and hooking the person up with their support. And so we provided a nice little graphic for you of what some of those things look like. Um, so towards the end here, we're going to talk a little bit about involuntary case planning and guardianship because we know there's been some questions about that. So we wanted to give you, um, sort of wrap up this morning with a little bit on um, how this piece works. Um, so it's important to know um, that typically um, consent is required, but there are about 3% of all services that we implement for APS clients that are done without the client's consent or involuntary. Um, and so if a person lacks if they're temporarily unable to make decisions, 
if they have a guardian, and if they have a guardian, then the guardian will make decisions, or if there's a violation of the law. Um, so there's a variety of services that we could be um, putting in place in these circumstances, like hospitalization, treatment, uh, or capacity evaluations. And obviously, the most restrictive and voluntary service is when um, APS at the county level petitions for guardianship or conservatorship. So we wanted to talk a little bit about guardianship and what that looks like for APS. Um, there, APS cannot just go out and seek guardianship of an individual. Again, we have to meet that definition of at-risk adults and it has to be mistreatment for APS to get involved. Once APS is involved, statute urges but does not require the county APS program to seek or petition for guardianship when the adult lacks capacity and there's nobody else to take the guardianship. Um, so we have some counties that will petition for guardianship. There are other counties who will not, who just have a practice that they don't do that. Um, and statutorily, they're not required to. Um, when, when the county petitions for guardianship, however, there are statutes and requirements that they have to adhere to as far as, um, you know, providing evidence, um, and the court ultimately decides um, when the county gets guardianship. Mm -hmm. I think I'm fascinated and not totally comfortably so with the notion that some counties, based on their discretion, would seek involuntary guardianship status, while others would not. I'm curious to see the list. It occurs to me, it occurs to me and if anything is going to be standardized, outstanding sort of our culture here for local control and understanding the counties, the dynamics in these counties. That that, should I be worried about that? It feels like I should be worried about that. Should I be worried about that? Um, I agree with that too. <laughs> Let me tell you what I know about it, um, and we can get you data and stuff like that um, on this. In some counties, they don't petition for guardianship because they have other resources available. Um, for example, in Colorado Springs, there's a nonprofit agency that does guardianships, and so APS, when they get a case that they feel like somebody, you know, there's no family member or anyone else to sue guardianship, they can they can refer to that agency. So I would be personally, I would be less concerned because it's not like they're just dropping it, right? They're they're handing it off to somebody who's qualified and um, able to do that. Um, in smaller counties, some of the reason why they typically don't do it is um, they just don't get a lot of cases. So um, maybe they would if it was a really extreme situation, but you don't have, you know, they haven't um, because they just haven't gotten a case that would be bad. Um, and then there is the discretionary piece. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, I know, for example, Denver County does keep guardianships. Um, there's also a resource component. If you're, you know, not only is the guardianship kind of intensive, but you're keeping that APS case open. So it takes some time to support that. Okay. Um, and then there's also the some anecdotal data, we don't have that available right now, like at our disposal, but what we can potentially do is like survey, you know, the counties to get that information that's collected. Um, because we wouldn't know necessarily if we have other resources or not. Um, so we can ask sort of a series of questions that if we get at what you're looking for to find out. But I think it's a component of that also might be that if a county has makes a policy decision that they're not going to do that. Or is that even measurable because the county of some communities have less, have a lot of, uh, I guess what I would say, family support for an individual who might be in that position. And so a 
formal guardianship may never be entered into, even though if they didn't have that structure or family structure, it, it might be. And I, I think that would be a hard thing to kind of separate. Is we just don't haven't had any guardianships versus we won't do that. And I don't know. That that would be hard to separate out, I think. Yeah, I think my concern is really around not why counties don't, but why counties do. It occurs to me that that's the nuclear option. You're stripping away decision making capacity from someone. There better be a really good reason. And if we establish rigorous people <coughs> criteria that we want to meet before doing that, I'd like to make sure that it's the same in El Paso County as it is in, in Alamosa as it is in Larimer as it is in Sun, etc. I, I, could, I would just say, from, from my experience as a county commissioner, we don't go around looking for guardianships because we don't make, they cost us a lot of money and resources. And so if we can find someone else who's going to serve that purpose, uh, we will utilize them. Yeah, and we would exhaust that process before we, you know, any county would do it. But at the end of the day, if somebody's just left to neglect, because no one will step up. That's a problem too, right? I, I might just make the underscore the point that <coughs> counties must go before a judge to yep. get that guardianship. Yes. So there is scrutiny David to to answer your concern. The third party is looking at that and saying, Is there anyone else? And that's been my experience as I've talked to counties, is that they very much like what you're saying, Thomas and Julie, is we don't have we don't want to step into that. We want to seek other people, natural supports that can fulfill that role. And so I, I think there's a number of protections, but we can still provide the information relative to what counties are have a guardianship program and what counties don't. Now that's what I want to clarify. So at, at any given time, there's around 20 counties that have guardianship in place. I don't know of any counties that have such a firm policy against guardianship that they would not take a guardianship if that became the only thing necessary. For example, there's a very tiny county um, gets a handful of reports a year. Um, hadn't had a guardianship in the first 15 years I worked in this program and ended up with a case where they had to call us because that was really the last resort. Um, and so while counties may not do it on a regular basis, what I found is that if they get to a point where they haven't been able to identify a family member or another appropriate person, and there truly is no other option, they, they're not going to let that person hang out there without some protections. Okay. And then to address David's um, concerns, we have some examples coming up that I think will give you some idea of why, what you do, Stephanie. Because here's some data, I know you kind of were talking about how big you use this. Um, and so in the last two fiscal years, we provided services, so that he's planning the services, to over 14,000 at-risk adults. Just under 150 of those, or about 1%, resulted in the county uh, petitioning for guardianship and receiving it. And only about 15 of those over that two year period um, were adults with IDD. And then the additional data is that last fiscal year, um, courts awarded guardianship in um, 54 cases to the county, and um, 12 of those started as emergency guardianships and then became. Uh, and we did go back and look at a statistically valid sample of guardianship cases from last year. And um, in our assessment, they were all appropriate for guardianship, so there weren't counties going out and just doing this just because. Um, and uh, we have some examples of what guardianship, both emergency and um, permanent guardianship, so I like um, So I'm just gonna sort of review one of these examples. I'm gonna pick the one on the bottom. Less words. So, an 80 year old uh, individual with advanced dementia, POA for those who don't know, is a power of attorney. Uh, 
they were refusing to pay for the interim care, but instead began using their funds to pay themselves $8,000 a month. Um, the emergency conservator uh, appointed, was appointed to get control of those funds, and the power of attorney stopped providing uh, care without notice. So at, at an emergency guardianship was appointed by the court to APS um, to facilitate the placement of this decision making for that individual. It's a uh, fairly extreme example of um, what somebody needs to do guardianship. This is an uh, older adult with um, advanced dementia. Um, they need some support here. But again, those are very, very rare. And then a typical guardianship example, we have some examples here. Um, Actually, no, let's pick the shortest one again on the bottom. Um, a 50-year-old with a traumatic uh, brain injury uh, was unable to complete activities of daily living or provide for their own safety. The family refused to act as a guardian, um, so the county ended up petitioning for guardianship and the court was awarded it to, for that individual. Um, and then we have, I know you probably can't see this very well, and it's not very clear in your packet. We have another handout for you that we can pass around that's a bigger, sort of clearer version of this, but we wanted to provide you with the life of the case. Um, and so this is kind of what we talked about today. Um, and it's there for your reference and study. And I would just say that you guys have been tremendously um, curious and engaging, and I appreciate all the discussion. If you do have questions or want more information, we do have an annual report online, and you can always email us um, if you're curious about something. That's where we're at. What, what other questions do you have? Yes. Um, so, of the screen outs, what's the likelihood that we eventually get back in? You know, because they're, they're pretty high risk. They just maybe got lucky and screened out. Don't have to have it. I think about that through the whole child welfare stream right. as well. We did have a sharp fellow do some small guys. It's a great question, but we don't. Remember the slide with the, the six APS staff to do all the training? If you, if you can help us increase that number, we can get you better answers. <laughs> So with my obsession about that high graph, eighteen percent come from care facilities, and would it be feasible for you to check in with your uh, child welfare people and see how does that eighteen percent compare to a parallel number in a child protection system? Um, you know, a sense of foster home allegations substantiated and congregate care. I would, I would caution you as uh, when you start diving into data comparisons, uh, the definition of what we're including in the facilities category for our purposes obviously measure parents and infant children. So what we could potentially do is provide to you like what types of facilities it makes up and then let you see for the may have what types of facilities that makes up. I don't think it would be out you know, apples to apples, because I don't know in the children's side of things what facilities would be the equivalent of the adult facilities. Sure. But well, it seems like you can parse out approximations. Right. There's also a, a distinction between the two types of cases. Children, uh, children can't say, get out of my life, I don't want you to protect me. I could say that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, in, in the system, I, I think would be more a, a interventionist in, in that regard. Our our cases, we're dealing with adults that can say, you know, uh, but it, it's an interesting question in terms of the facilities. Uh, we, we would have to look at what so, facilities are included in, in our group, and then what facilities are involved in it. Because foster care is. Uh, licensed, right, um, and by the, by the state, and so there would be a lot of differences between the two groups. Yeah, so I'm looking at the page five, 
client living arrangement. Yeah, we'll yeah. all the caveats. And, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe you find out there's no way to parse it out. But and your, earlier question, your earlier question yeah. was, what is their target? Right? What, is, what is acceptable? How far away are they from what they consider? Like, so, yeah, whatever. I, I mean, I understand. They're right. Like, you still seem like... Uh, just one quick question. Was I dozing, or did we not discuss the adult protective services due process? Um, so, a point of clarification, we can talk about that now, but that is um, part of Rule Packet 2 that you'll hear um, during the rulemaking session in a little bit. Um, and so we developed that and provided that to you because um, I think there have been a concern expressed that the rules themselves are pretty complicated and there's a lot of timelines. Um, so this is this is pending your approval um, of what it would look like if you approve the rules as is. Yeah. I did have a question. I saw that we had information submitted by the ombudsman, and yes. I do take the ombudsman's role. Like, I think that's a helpful role. You sure, I don't see that necessarily here, or I just haven't studied it close enough. No, Maybe that's a great question. Sure. Let, me, let, me, let me interrupt you. I want to make sure that the extent to which the rule packet that we'll hear this morning, okay. about which this written testimony has been submitted, is considered in our rulemaking session. Okay. And so that as we, as we contemplate testimony and feedback, yep. we are taking it into context. With and then feed on the record. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's let that I, I can address just uh, real quickly, when we talked about joint investigations and um, collaboration among investigator groups, um, we have mentioned CCDs, law enforcement, CPAG, um, sometimes we will ask a partner or coordinate with the long-term care enforcement in the community um, on, on those cases. And that, for confidentiality statutes, is an acceptable way for um, APS to share information about APS if they both have a um, I don't want to go through the whole case investigation process map, but I do think it can be a little confusing the difference between providing services within the case and the investigation of in of a report. What's could you explain the relationship between those two things? Sure. Um, and this is something I didn't mention during the presentation, but in, um, once a case is over, so once a report is screened in, the case is over. The investigation and the assessment and the case planning for the individual happen pretty simultaneously. So the caseworker is both for doing all those interviews, gathering the evidence for the investigation, um, but similarly at the same time, you know, conducting that assessment tool, um, determining what the needs of the individual are, trying to start to get the services in place. So they're kind of simultaneous processes. Um, depending on the case and the situation, one can be a little further ahead than the other. Um, but ultimately, those are you know, pretty tandem. So can a case continue to be open after the investigation has been closed and the finding is substantiated or unsubstantiated? Correct. Um, so the majority of cases will be closed um, once the investigation is complete and the um, assessment and case planning has been done and services have been put in place. Um, a case can continue to be open um, for example, a guardianship case, an APS case would stay open if the APS was the guardian and they would continue to be required to do monthly visits to that individual. Mark, thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. 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 Extraordinarily Thank you. Thank it is 10 o'clock straight up. We'll recess five minutes, please, I know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. For everybody who's joined us today, know that we are trying something for the first time ever. Um, we're trying electronic access, not just to listen into our meetings, but also to provide testimony. And so, so I am audio is recording. I think someone can hear the show, so I think I can start with okay. a different audio. Uh, okay. Okay. okay.
So hopefully, we're going to try this, and it's going to be superb and effective. And if it isn't, I apologize profusely in advance, and I promise there is nothing that um, folks um, would bring us that won't be entered into the record. Somehow, some way, we will make sure that it gets it all in. But, but do uh, be patient with us as we try and sort through this uh, electronic public testimony stuff. I would also ask, Thank you. We can hear you. That's not loud and clear. Thank you. That is excellent. Um, I also want to ask that for uh, members of the board, anybody else, oh, and anybody else, please do wait to be recognized so that folks who are in fact listening in uh, know who's talking. For those of you who are listening in and um, are providing for us testimony, we will recognize you. I'll call you out by name. Um, it's super hard when it's electronic. I'm struck by our inability, for example, to read intent in text messages because it's really hard. Um, and for those of you joining us online, we'll have that same obstacle. Uh, know that if I interrupt you, it is not because I'm trying to be rude, um, but rather trying to, to keep us relatively uh, focused and on schedule. I don't know that I've got any other disclaimers or caveats to offer vis-a-vis -vis our electronic uh, testimony and protocols this morning. So, with all of that established, I'm going to lay my hands on my agenda. Every month, the State Board of Human Services reserves the first 15 minutes of of each board meeting <coughs> to hear from members of the public on any issue that isn't on the agenda for the day. Um, and so I would welcome, looks like we've got, that's document two, that's document one. Looks like we have one, two, three, members with us today signed up to provide testimony in that open comment period. And Ms. Froning, good morning. Uh, are you wanting good morning. To, are you wanting to testify during the open comment period as well as in reference specifically to rule document number two? That's up to you. Uh, it's very brief. I could go ahead now or I will wait for you to call on me later. Your choice. Thank you, Ms. Froney. I will. I will indeed call on you. Um, so, let us start then with Maureen Welch. Good morning. Join us, please. And just a reminder for the sake of it, this is on stuff that isn't on the agenda. For those of you who are signed up and wish to sign up to testify on document number two or document number one. Um, you can do that. We have the sign-up sheets, and you can testify as regards that specific set of documents. Good morning, Ms. Welch. Introduce you. yourself, please, and tell us what you want us to do. Sure. So are the microphones up there? Okay, <laughs> I'm used to having them there. So um, my name is Maureen Welch. Thank you. It's good to see you all again. And there's a few new faces that I haven't been able to meet before, so um, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the rule packets. I'll do that later. But I wanted to comment a little bit in general about um, two issues. Uh, one is just the level of anxiety and concern around the lack of clarity in a lot of these things. And even today, as you were speaking, my anxiety level was going up because of you all being so intelligent and understanding of human services are still confused. Imagine how people in the community feel. It's very unclear. The fact that people can't see the actual investigation for the court order makes it even more secret. And that's why we're calling it the KGB. We're calling APS perpetrators because we have no idea what they're doing. We have no idea where they're operating because the process isn't clear. So that flow chart that Mindy made um, I think is helpful in some ways and that's something that I asked her to do um, because I think presenting it visually for a lot of people is more easy. Um, but I really think that the state board needs to look at the civil rights violations that are going on 
um, you know, Martin Luther King's uh, uh, assassination uh, was just recent, uh, same month I was born, it was from 50. Um, and I'm concerned about the lack of civil rights for this community. We're stripping people of civil rights. Um, and my, one of my big questions is who determines capacity? We keep talking about capacity. Uh, the APS workers go to a five day training. Are they legitimate to review medical records? Are they able to speak to a person to determine if they're processing? Um, my son doesn't speak. How do they determine him? Even psychologists in the schools don't know how to assess him. He's inaccessible. That's on his um, report to the federal government. So how do we determine capacity? How do we determine APS has the right to intervene? This is really concerning to me. And then the other thing that's raised my anxiety is that my son is turning 11 next month. Okay, rule packet three, which is not the agenda today, so I can speak to it, right, Mr. Chair? I believe that's in this. Okay. Yeah. Um, rule packet three. Although, so, let, me, let me acknowledge this. I haven't seen rule packet three. I know. I know. Well, this is, <laughs> it, it contributes to the overall anxiety. Thank you. Um, I've had some nightmares lately because we went to the stakeholder meeting that um, Mindy was kind enough to organize and her staff. And I learned that um, people can be charged with, uh, or substantiated, I shouldn't say charged, uh, substantiated um, as young as 11 years old. So we're talking about giving minors a label of substantiation. That to me is extremely concerning from a civil rights perspective. Um, and being a former recovering teacher myself, um, and a parent of three boys who are quite rough, because they're little boys. I just don't think that's an appropriate thing for APS to be getting involved with. Um, there's too much gray area there. Uh, and I'll close so that other people can comment. I listened to the Martin Luther King I Have a Dream speech several times over the last week. And we've come so far, and I feel like this is really turning the clock back on the at-risk community. Even when we talk about self-determination, when we talk about least restrictive environment, I don't see those happening because everything's behind a curtain of secrecy and APS. So my question here is, is this really something that the board can move forward with without really questioning the legalities of civil rights? There are several civil rights attorneys in town who have said it's lawless. There's not enough due process. There's not enough um, notification of individuals. No one is notified when the case is open. When an investigation starts, no one knows. That leads to that anxiety. So I've had um, nightmares of my son being dragged, dragged out of my house since we had that stakeholder meeting because he's 11, and according to Rule Packet Three, he can be charged as a substantiated perpetrator. We don't have perpetrator defined though. We don't have it defined. Um, I'm very concerned. So um, I'm coming here. I've had many conversations with parents who are too afraid to um, make public comments. So I just want to tell you that, unlike what uh, Director Vika said in front of the JPC, which I personally found quite offensive, that there's just a couple of advocates causing all these problems and uh, putting the pause on this whole issue. It's more than a couple of advocates. I have thousands of people on my newsletters. I hear from hundreds of them. But the fear is so great in our community, so great. So please, um, I really respect all of you. I appreciate the efforts that um, the department has made in doing the stakeholder meetings. I really appreciate the fact of the public comment being open. I see a lot of efforts being made to become more transparent. But those are actually not extras. Those are things that every democratic state and department should be doing, is having access for individuals, having ability to um, go to a meeting and uh, get minutes. They created an actual website where we can actually see the minutes and agendas online. It's shocking. It used to be you have to be in the department and go through a portal. That's open records law. Okay, having that transparency is really important. And that brings down that anxiety. So let's keep working on bringing down the anxiety. Let's press the pause button on all this APS stuff until we really understand it and we make sure civil rights are protected. And I know we have an assistant AG here, but um, I'm very concerned that civil rights attorneys are looking at these and saying, uh, no, this isn't going to fly in a court of law. And I know this is an administrative department, but it can be taken to a court of law to be questioned. So thank you very much, and I'll pass the baton to my Thank you, Ms. Welch. And before we do that, any questions from the board? It's not right now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good morning, sir. Mr. Chairman, introduce yourself for the record. Let us know what you want to hear. I'm Bob Hernandez, and uh, what I've done to present to you is a, uh, a 
let's say it's a postmaster's pre-doctoral uh, paper that I've written. Um, it's draft. It's in draft form. And I sort of assembled it last night uh, as I was thinking about this, but what has caught my attention for quite some time is this slide from APS's own training. Mr. Hernandez, let me interrupt. You do have a copy of this yeah. paper at your, at your um, place. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's from the follow-up book. And, yeah. and under their own training, it says, a history of repeated emergency room or hospital admissions is, is an indicator of physical abuse. The question that, that raises to me is that we know that uh, individuals with IDD, most of 40% of them are diagnosed with four chronic conditions or more. And let me read to you the chairman's own words. People with IDD are far more likely than their typical developing peers to experience health disparities, disproportionately higher rates of chronic disease, and have access to preventative primary care and health promotion resources. And because there are excessive wait times in this country, four weeks or more, for this population, they can't wait four weeks to see the PCP. And so the only other option that they have is if they don't have option to, if, if urgent care isn't available, but many times if our nurturing care facility can't handle uh, the types of treatment that they need that an emergency room can. And so you're going to see more um, IDD individuals with chronic conditions in emergency rooms. And particularly, uh, Maureen and I have heard of several cases where the physicians have said, if this happens, here's the standing order. Here's our standing protocol. You take little Susie or little Phil to the emergency room because my office is not open on the weekends. And so you have a standing order. And so if they're Kaiser, which has excellent uh, uh, electronic health records, that will all be there. And so the, the attending physician can say, oh, this is why you brought little Susie and Sally in because of their chronic condition. That can be treated, I, my clinic's not open. Or what you will see is that you might have a surgeon who will say, well, wait a minute, we can do this procedure in the emergency room as opposed to keeping the individual hospitalized for, for three months or for three days, waiting for a slot in the, uh, the operating room. So we can, so they, they're trying to lean it down. Um, and for whatever reason that might be, it's, it's a surgical procedure. But it saves money and it saves time. However, but according to this, that would be a history of repeated emergency room or hospital admissions. So what I'm trying to explain to you is that people with intellectual developmental disabilities are going to have these chronic conditions. They are born with them, they are diagnosed with them, and you will continue to see them in emergency rooms, especially when physicians order them. So keep that in mind as, as you're looking at rules, but, but there are lots of findings that say, uh, as you look at this, and, and, and I won't read this word for word, but I wanted to have it this available for you for reference so that you can see and two of the, two of the, uh, the references that I printed out were done by, um, by, by the chairman, uh, along with uh, another colleague. But that's why it was important to, for you to understand, to bring that forward so you know that um, people that, that work with, with this population, um, certainly uh, the chairman understands it because this is what he does. Um, certainly Maureen understands it because this is what she, she lives. I mean, families and people who do this, they live this every day with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So what I'm asking the board to really consider is that, take a look at this very closely, you know, and weigh that against um, the rules and the potential rules that you might see coming forward. Because you have to understand that, that records are there and doctors are mandatory reporters. If they see something amiss, it's their duty to report it. They're not gonna just sit there and say, oh, we didn't see something. But when you see chronic conditions come back into the emergency room time and time and time again that are part of a doctor's standards orders, and we've seen cases where APS has completely ignored a doctor's orders and said, well, we're, we're going to substantiate everybody because that's what we do. Uh, the problem is, is that I've heard, I, I talked to a physician today who's a PCP for an IDD individual said, you know, Rob, I can't disclose anything, but I had APS come forward to me and ask me to, to, to change my notes. I said, well, I can't do that. I'm a medical doctor. I'm not an investigator. I've reported to you what I've seen and what, what I've ordered and what I've advised. And so you need to understand that there's a, a whole set of in, unintended consequences that might happen as a result of someone sitting there, and, and I forget who asked the question about, is this maybe, um, Mr. Davidson, you asked, is this consistent county by county by county? Okay. We're not seeing that. I mean, what Maureen is hearing and what I'm hearing is that one county might do more guardianships or they might do more substantiations than another. In other words, even though this is a state-operated 
the state has oversight, you have 64 different counties with 64 different ways and interpretations of doing things. But my point being is that I did all this research just so that you would know that IDD individuals are going to have repeat emergency room visits. And the last thing we want to do is have parents not take their individual or anyone take anyone to emergency room because they're afraid of being flagged for APS when in fact they need care. See what I mean? I don't want that to be a barrier to care, the fear. And, and in addition to that, um, you know, because when you jump to a preponderance of evidence, which is the next thing, just because someone has gone to an emergency room is not a preponderance of evidence. That's medical care. And had the family or families not do that, then, then they would be guilty of mistreatment for not taking the emergency room. You, you sort of see the incongruence. And so that's what I wanted to point out. That's why I spent some time doing this research, so you would understand that this part about emergency rooms or, or repeated hospital admissions probably needs to have a second look or taken out. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. That's why I spent some time doing this. So thank you very much. And again, thank you, Mr. Hanley. Next questions. Ms. Walker. You know, it would be my, I, 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 hear, I, I hear what you're saying for yes. sure, but isn't this something taken in full? I mean, obviously someone's bleeding. That's not going to be the department's not like, I mean, this is a whole host of things that if multiple things were happening. So I understand your point about certainly someone should be taken to the hospital anytime emergency care or care is needed and yeah. a physician is not available. That should not be in itself a reason for substantiation. But taken all together, you can start to see patterns. Do you understand? It makes, what? Makes, it makes sure. um, except the reason I bring this forward is because the focus was emergency visits and repeat hospital admissions. And we know of a couple of cases where APS jumped in and has guardianship. And we've seen repeat emergency visits. We've seen we've seen the care get worse, is what we've seen. So that's why so they started off by saying a family member, you took little Susie to the emergency room, so therefore you are we have determined that you are a perpetrator and guilty of neglect. So that's why I focused on this. So yes, all of the other things, but but this but this is a critical piece. So when they focus on this and jump in for to do the things that they do, that's the part that I'm separating out because, yes, I would agree, but that's not what's happening with emergency visits or, or hospital admissions. That's why I did all the data and all the research to show that, that that's not what's happening. Any further questions for Mr. Hunter? Thank you. Thank you. Seeing none, is there a Mr. Knox with us? Come on forward. Is there another chair we can okay. sort of scoot up? Thank you, Ms. Welch. You're very kind. <laughs> sure. Thank you. I'm Don Knox with the Home Care Association of Colorado. And first, I want to say what a great presentation that was on APS. Really terrific. And I appreciate all you do. We didn't talk about how you're going to pay for the due process, it's going to be on mandatory background checks. And uh, we have two issues cost and speed. Uh, Speed is uh, up to 10 days turnaround time. That's too long. It should be instant in most cases. And I prepared a report on how you can do it. It's also at your, at your place. Yeah. It comes from and then, uh, and that's substantial because we imagine there are going to be about 120 to 150,000 checks a year. So if you do the math on the 10 days, 1.2 to 1.5 million business days lost, paydays care days, you know, it is huge, potentially. And it needn't be, you know, I was a project manager for the college judicial branch, a contractor on the cohort system, which we were the first state to have online judicial records available. 2001, instant search, instant return. They tell us this is private data, and it's not public data. So it's not, it can't, it's not a comparable situation. But in 99% of the cases, it will be a no-hit. There won't be a Chris Watney. There won't be a Bernard Busher. There won't be a Constance Rule in the database. Oh, it would be astronomically small that that would happen. And, and it wouldn't be one of you. So um, there's no reason that a uh, search can't return immediately. And I'm told that it's a uh, first name, last name, date of, date of birth search, no associated <coughs> That is exactly how the cohort system operates. And if you did get a, ret a return that wasn't a no-hit, um, 
then you can do the human, human investigation of the record. So at that stage, the screen would display, hey, it's taking a little bit longer. We're not going to give you an immediate return. But for the 99% of the cases that are no hit, immediate return, person's hired, they're working that day. Really, really critical. Second thing, cost. Um, a, a CBI background check is $6.85, a name search. Uh, cohorts check, uh, if you buy in volume, if you're a big hospital system or a home health agency, you can buy it for as little as two fifty dollars a check. You're proposing a cap of $35. The fiscal note had $16.50. This is going to come out of the agencies and out of the consumers, <coughs> out of Medicare and Medicaid. This, all, all these costs are going to get passed to other people. So I do want you to be mindful of the cost and the speed. Right. Thank you, Mr. Knox. Questions for Mr. Knox? Mr. Knox, this is a discussion. Mr. Davidson. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We do have people listening online. Mr. Was this is a discussion item during the passage of 17-1284? Mr. Knox. Uh, it has been discussed. You know, more details came out about the system. Obviously, the $35 cap couldn't have been discussed because the fiscal note anticipated 1650 um, I don't think we, we provided enough information about the speed of the search. Frankly, it didn't occur to us in 2018 that we were going to use human-powered searches here. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from Mr. Knox? Thank you, sir, for Thank being you. with us. Thank you so much. Mr. Tatton. Thank you. My name is Jim Tatton. I'm representing myself. In November 2008, I suffered a severe traumatic brain injury. Uh, I testify and appear today as a cognitively disabled adult. Under Colorado statute, I am an at-risk adult. Uh, my purpose today is to call public attention to these invisible cognitive injuries specifically traumatic brain injuries. I can't smell, I can't taste, I can't read, I can't comprehend. I'm not in a wheelchair, my arm's not in a sling, and I don't wear a pirate's patch. Invisible injuries are very difficult to live with, whether as an individual, as a family member, um, or as an individual trying to reassimilate back into the community. Uh, my ask to the board is to proceed cautiously. If adopted, these rules will have the full force and effect of the law. Um, and I think my cons uh, consistent consistent message over the past couple of weeks has been that the rules and regulations touch individuals, families, communities, businesses, and industries. Uh, I hope my message and my concern carries some weight with you because first I am an at-risk adult with uh, and I'm cognitively disabled. Uh, secondly, uh, Soon after my injury, I resigned from the board of Arc of Denver. I was a board member of Advocacy Denver for about 17 years. I was the treasurer for a long, long time. And I think more importantly, for almost three decades, I've helped shape state legislation and regulation in over 25 states. If I have a concern with proposed regulations, I think the board caught all I share my concern. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Tapper? Ms. Rule. Yes, thank you for coming and testifying today. I'm, I'm curious what aspect of the rule package or, or the rules you're concerned about. Mr. Tapper. My concern is probably with regard to the due process structure under the overall umbrella of legal standards, whether those be 
standards concerning allegations and burdens of proof. My real concern results from the discussions I heard on the floor of the State Senate earlier this week concerning allegations. I don't want the board to use these rules to fall into the same legal uh, uh, experiment, you know, PR hole that the legislature has fallen into. And that's, I, that's not a statement with regard to, you know, the weight and the evidence. I think it's the process that's failed. I saw a public stoning on the floor of the state senate. I heard stories of an individual and his family and his children being harmed as a result of these allegations. I listened to a state senator speak before the public and say, I've investigated over a thousand crimes, murders, sexual assaults, sexual assault of children. The report that the Senate has before us, if my deputy had written this, he'd be, he wouldn't be a deputy. That's what I'm concerned with. Everyone, we have a shared goal. Everyone wants to protect individuals, families, and communities. What I don't want, what I don't want is for a system to be in place that falls apart as the process is moving forward like we saw, not only in the Colorado House of Representatives, but also the Colorado State Senate. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, folks, here's where, where, where I've been struggling, okay? Um, the specific question I would ask you is where and in which ways are these rules inconsistent with the state statute? Our job is to put meat around a state statute. And I, I hear the concerns about due process, but I need to be specifically told that this language is inconsistent with or exceeds what the state statute contains. Our role is limited. We, we don't get to second guess the legislature. We only get to write <coughs> the details around statutes they've already passed. And that is the, that's where I'm not making a nexus. Can you help me? Mr. Tutton? Or Mr. Hernandez, since you're still there? Well, I think as you're, you're going to hear some more testimony from people who were involved with the state board of meetings. You will see, Representative Busher, you will see a couple of instances where where the department is actually going outside with proposed rules that have nothing to do with House Bill 17, 1284. So we'll cite those specific examples. So that's a very good question. So I agree that if you're sticking to the statute, the charge of this board is to try to follow it as best as they can. But you also know the process as well. The board can approve this. They, they get approved by the Secretary of State. Then there, there's a whole other process that, that it goes through continues on through the legislature as they look to see uh, where those rules put together correctly. So, uh, good question. Um, so, I, I know that Mr. Tatton is also a practicing attorney, correct me if I'm wrong. Not anymore, but, 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 but he's still an attorney, he has a JD, and so, um, and, and having worked with him for 20 some odd years, well, the entire time I was in the legislature, I found him to be very credible, very, uh, very reasonable, very rational in, in, his, in, in, in his approach to things. So, but that's a very good question. But I know what the other thing that he's referring to is he's referring to Senator Cook. And Senator Cook, who was looking at, uh, I don't know, somehow he got a, a, a copy of the <coughs> investigative report. And his, one of his concerns was, well, wait a minute, the, the, the senator that was mentioned had an attorney, so therefore he's not credible. Mr. Combs. So after discussing with um, OVH, with my colleagues, uh, with, these, with Dr. Martin, um, the, the way OVH reads the statute is that an intervening professional can, um, that, that section on an intervening professional releasing someone from custody refers to the 72-hour hold, 
and the transport is a process that concludes once once there's a warm transfer to the facility. Um, there's no sort of release from the transport. Uh, it doesn't, there doesn't need to be someone signing off saying, okay, this transport is over. As long as there's a handoff, the transport concludes by its own terms. And I discussed with Dr. Martin, and uh, I think we both feel that uh, this could be, got, we could go into more detail in the trainings to providers. That would be useful, but uh, it, it doesn't need to be uh, discussed further um, in consideration for the Mm -hmm. Additional or further questions or comments for the department? Anything further from the department? Mm -hmm. Move the adoption of document number one, incorporating the statement of basis and purpose and specific statutory authority contained in the record. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Busher. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same so. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We move document number two. <laughs> the Adult Protective Services Program revisions should be brought to the table for discussion. Good morning again, Mr. Wester. Good morning. Good morning, yes. Um, I would point out in your uh, binders, members of the board, there are two letters, one from the Office of the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman, the second from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, they are submitted in support of document number two. We just referenced them. You know that they are there. Um, that would be great. Mr. Wester, you brought guests. If you would introduce yourself first for the record, and then your guests, and walk us through document number two. Uh, by all means, Mr. Chair, my name is Mark Wester. I'm the director of the Office of Community Access and Independence. And my last name is Mindy Camp, who is the division director. Uh, for adult and aging uh, services, including APS, and, and then Kara Kroll, uh, who is part of our ARD uh, uh, unit, and uh, they will be assisting me as we uh, look at the uh, rule package. All right, Mr. Mr. Weston. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, State board members, uh, we are bringing back Rule Packet 17-26-06-02 for final adoption. Uh, this is document number two in the packet today. Uh, you might recall that we did a first reading uh, back in February up in Larimer County. Uh, I appreciated the robust discussion we had at uh, that time. Uh, since that time, I just want to give you a uh, high-level uh, description of uh, our response as an office and as a department uh, in response to that meeting. First of all, uh, we took uh, feedback about uh, specific changes that you recommended in this rule packet, and we will highlight those later on. So we appreciate that. Uh, secondly, uh, we've slowed the rulemaking process. We delayed the second reading until this date, uh, and we're not before you uh, last month. And uh, then uh, we will be, uh, so uh, we delayed the, the rule packet process. One of the reasons for that is uh, the state board asked us to do, uh, to be sure that we had uh, completely and comprehensively engage stakeholders uh, in the process, and uh, we've done that. Uh, we scheduled three stakeholder meetings uh, that were open to uh, providers, uh, family members, anyone concerned, and we tried to distribute those uh, invitations widely. Uh, we did, on March 8th, we met uh, uh, with stakeholders for uh, approximately two hours. Um, and uh, in that, during that time, we presented the APS 101 that we presented the board this morning and had a good conversation, really focusing on the overview of the APS program. 
on March 13th, we uh, we met again with um, stakeholders on Rule Packet 2. You might recall that we had a stakeholder engagement meeting back in January, I believe January 25th, where we reviewed Rule Packet 2 at that time with stakeholders. So we had a second meeting on March 13th, uh, really to get their specific feedback and ask them for specific feedback about how to improve uh, Rule Packet 2. Uh, and then March 28th, um, and I won't go much into this, but I, I think it's important that we uh, review Rule Packet 3, which you will see uh, for the first time in May uh, at that uh, stakeholder engagement, and uh, we got feedback from the stakeholders at that time as well. Um, so uh, I really appreciate the, the feedback that we've gotten both from the board, from stakeholders, from providers. Uh, we do have also a timeline that we wanted to share with you kind of the, the context behind our implementation plan. Uh, statute requires us to implement this and begin background checks on January 1st, 2019. And so based on that statutory deadline, we've developed an implementation plan and we wanted to give you an overview uh, of that for reference. Yeah. And I mentioned earlier that uh, we had delayed and slowed down the rulemaking process, uh, even with those considerations and the, uh, the schedule that you see here, uh, we are still on track to meet the statutory deadline. But it does give you context about uh, exactly what were uh, all the moving parts, or not all the moving parts, but a high-level review of the moving parts of implementing this, this bill. The items that are shaded in green um, are um, the anticipated date of state board review. Uh, the orange items are dependent upon rule packet number two adoption. And then um, the yellow items are dependent upon rule packet 3 adoption. And one of the components that uh, is involved in standing up uh, this background check process is there are staff to hire and train and onboard before uh, we can actually have the infrastructure to do the background check. Any questions? I might regret asking, but I'm going to ask anyway. Rule Packet 3, I find myself for the second time this morning trying to decide whether I'm comfortable or uncomfortable with knowing that there's been some discussion about 3 that is informing thinking, certainly from a stakeholder perspective, it sounds like, about 3. Um, and to the extent that comments then or, or testimony may affect seats of perhaps connect two to three, or I feel a sense of flying a little bit blind in our decision making process. And so it's curious that three is out there as part of the debate, and I think that's generally speaking good, more information better. But we have a we have to contextualize as best as conceivably <coughs> possible to make as informed a decision as possible. And that information is not known to the board. So can you sort of help me understand, even if it's just by way of process, you don't have to agree with me, um, why that's been part of the conversation so far. And um, let me just see if that's a good enough question to get an answer. Uh, Mr. West, do you want to? Take a shot at that, or would you defer? Uh, I'll defer to Mindy uh, from Ms. Kemp uh, to respond to that. Ms. Kemp, can you introduce yourself for the record, please, again, and then respond to the question. Sure. Um, good morning, still. Um, my name is Mindy Kemp, and I'm the Director of the Division of Aging and Adult Services. And so that's a great question. Um, let me sort of explain the process and where we're at in that, and then that will try to hopefully address the concerns that we have. Um, so the reason why we decided to chunk this into three different rule packets, as you recall, um, we passed rule packet one several months ago. That was very simply related to APS training requirements that we needed to have a place early on. So we couldn't wait until 
this point in time to get those passed. So we, we decided to sort of separate that and get that taken care of early on. Um, we did need more time to develop the draft due process rules, which is rule packet two. Um, so that's why you're hearing them sort of at this point in time. And then rule packet three really um, pertains to how the tax checks will be done. Um, and so there's a clear distinction between rule packet two and rule packet three. Rule packet two that you have before you today, um, and we call them one, two, and three, because we have for ourselves. Two pertains exclusively to things related to the due process. Three pertains specifically to how the employers will request the tax checks. Um, the thing that's getting a little muddy is the fact that we have been doing so much stakeholder engagement for the past six months um, that as we've been developing various versions of these rule packets um, and finalizing the version that you will all see as the final version for your consideration, we've been meeting with stakeholders. And so as we meet with stakeholders, as I take calls or have meetings personally with individuals, we're using that as an opportunity to work through any of the kinks in it. Um, so there are actually several things in Rule Project 3 that we had, you know, a draft two months ago that aren't in there anymore, and you won't even see, because we've identified, you know, unintended consequences or things that don't really make sense from the perspective of employers that we've already taken out. So, um, kind of the simple explanation is that there's not a lot of overlap between Rule Packet 2 and 3, but this really is due process related for today. And then next month, we'll talk more about how the actual tax checks will be done. Um, but we also didn't want you all to see a version of three that wasn't complete um, and that had draft, draft stuff that you're not even going to consider. Thank you. I guess I would observe, in fairness, that that, that sounds like a fairly standard process. For example, we don't see a rule proposal before it goes to PAC. Um, Typically, and I guess perhaps my question is just more grounded in the, in the notion that there's a big darn deal and it's complicated and complex. And I appreciate the department's want to create distinctions between one, two, and three on the one hand, and on the other hand, it strikes me that it's inevitably diffuse. Um, one, in fact, if not totally iterative, has some relationship to two, and one and two combine to have some relationship to three. So that's, I suppose, where. My question comes from, and I appreciate your answer because if that is standard practice, um, self making, um, and, and I don't want to create an exception to the rule um, necessarily, but it, it is useful to have that broader context as we deliberate the merits of the issue. So thank you for that answer. Do you want to follow up? Yeah, please. Um, and so one of the things that I know spreadsheets are talking colors and all that kind of stuff, but I think one of the things that will help clarify that as well is that um, when you look at this um, table that we've put together, the items in orange are really related to packet two. And so for the purposes of today, for example, if you were to approve rule packet two, then we would be able to make the second row, all of the updates to the tax data system that we need to make. We should be able, be able to start hiring for the person who would do the appeals. Um, and then starting in July, once that rule packet was actually on the books and effective, um, the due process would start for uh, people substantially doing the best cases. So versus the yellow, you'll see a lot of the start of that is starting in July all the way through January. That pertains to us hiring and making the data system modifications for how those tax checks will begin. Um, so you can see the distinction between we really need to get moving on the process piece because that's anticipated to start July 1st. Whereas we do have a little more time to discuss and work out take some time to walk through the tax checks process, which I know some stakeholders have um, you know, shared concerns and questions with you on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mark Wester, Director of OCAI. Uh, just to underscore what Mindy said, Packet 1 really deals with county staff and how we uh, prepare them. Packet 2 is uh, really installing, designed to install uh, due process into the CAPS uh, background check process 
and that's protections for the alleged uh, individuals that are alleged to have abused someone. Uh, and then packet three deals with primarily the operations of how employers are going to interface with the department to get the information. So that's another way of, of looking at uh, the three rule packets. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the board for um, encouraging us to go back and do further uh, stakeholder engagement. We thoughtfully considered the feedback of the stakeholders. It's been good conversations. It's, uh, it hasn't been easy at times, both for stakeholders and for uh, members of my team, but it's been uh, good and we've made some revisions. Uh, and in some cases, we have not made any revisions, and we'll go into that. But I'm going to turn it over to Mindy to start walking through the specific uh, uh, rule packet two, and uh, we'll be happy to entertain your questions as we go. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and so we're going to sort of jump into the rule part, but before we do that, on um, analysis page 13 of the rule packet, um, we have, I wanted to point out that we have made updates to the stakeholder feedback from the last version that we reviewed in February. Um, so there's information in there about the feedback we received specific to rule packet 2. We did, um, during some of the meetings in March, we see feedback on the general yes program or even rule packet 3. We will share that with you as appropriate during those times, but this is the feedback specific to this packet, and we've included information about whether or not we have, you know, made changes based on that feedback and some of our rationale for why. Um, and so ultimately, throughout the packet, you, you may have seen some yellow highlights, and so there are four key areas that we did change language or make additions since the February meeting. So what I thought I'd do um, right now is walk you through those four changes that are highlighted in yellow and let you know what's changed since the last version. And then I wanted to note that there was one additional area where I think folks on the state board had expressed questions or concern um, related to the definition of severity levels. And so um, I was hoping that we could walk through the highlights first to let you know what we've changed. Um, we did not make changes to the severity levels at this time, and so after we go through the highlights, maybe we can go back to severity levels and talk a little more about that. Um, so we're going to start on proposed rule point two in the packet. Um, and there you'll see that we've updated the definition of a case. One of the things that we heard from stakeholders is that the definition was a little confusing. Um, it, it was unclear sort of when a case starts and how long it should continue. And so we've updated the definition um, of a case to provide clarification that a case involves more than just an investigation. It involves uh, providing services and that the county department can continue to provide services under a case through the investigation as concluded. And we had um, alluded to this in the APS 101, is that in very limited circumstances, a case may re remain open um, almost indefinitely when a county you know, petitions the court and receives guardianship, that we wouldn't close the case, that that would remain an ongoing case, that the caseworker would be responsible for monthly in-person visits, um, those sorts of things. And so we thought defining a case more clearly would be helpful. Any questions on that? Okay, so moving on, we are going to propose rule page four. And again, based on stakeholder feedback, um, we've added a definition of preponderance of evidence. Um, it means the credible evidence that a claim is more likely than not true. Um, this had not previously been in APS rules, but there was a request from stakeholders to add this, so there was more clear of Are there any questions on that one? I may have asked this last month. Is there a, is there a Colorado statute sort of definition of preponderance, either in civil code or elsewhere? Uh, no, generally those are defined in state rules. Um, we're skipping ahead to proposed rule page 12. 
Um, this is a, an edit that was made based on feedback at the February State Board meeting. Um, and as you recall, in Rule Packet 1, we removed um, a reference to caseworkers requesting a social security number from the alleged perpetrator. And so we made this correction to remove this from this rule packet as well to align with that um, decision. And then we're going to skip ahead to page 15, the last of the yellow highlighted parts. Um, you'll see on number 10 and then on B3, we've made some updates to the language here because um, during some of our stakeholder feedback sessions, we received feedback that the language number 10 that we had proposed, the supervisor shall approve all the findings. Um, some made it seem like that was a rubber stamp process, that they have to approve all findings. Um, and we didn't intend for it to sound like that, so we worked on the language a little bit to make it more clear that they Supervisor shall review the investigation and approve only when they conclude a thorough investigation and the evidence justifies the finding. Um, just to make it clear that it's it's not that they have to approve everything that comes to them, but they have to make a determination. Mr. Cohn? I just had an update from my previous answer informed by my colleagues that um, the definition also comes from the Colorado jury instructions, which are um, court developed. Um, uh, language that is used in civil cases. So when you're sitting on a jury, the judge will read you off a set of instructions. Here's what the following terms mean. Preponderance of the evidence means blah, 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 blah. That's what the judges will use to instruct a jury when they're weighing evidence in a civil case under the preponderance of the evidence. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think, I, I think that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, my follow-up then would be, from whence does that come? Um, Mostly judges. Um, uh, primarily, I believe, uh, Colorado jury instructions are developed by civil judges. Um, uh, so are civil judges. And, and I hope you'll forgive this line of questions. I, I, forgive and indulge me. Um, is it reasonable to assume, or do we have some reason to know, in fact, that this, if eight different judges issue eight different sets of instructions to eight different juries, is the definition the same from each of those eight? So, yes, um, the Colorado jury instructions are developed by the Colorado Supreme Court, so that should answer the uniformity questions also. Thank you very much indeed. And then last question, is, at least as this is concerned, um, you mentioned in your first answer that it is defined in rule. You've amended that answer I just want to make sure that if there are eight different packages of rules, are they also using this Colorado Supreme Court defined definition of preponderance? Yes, my colleagues have been looking at other rules that are promulgated by this board as well as the Colorado jury instructions to make sure that they're aligned. Excellent, thank you. Please proceed. Mr. Chair, um, so that gets us through the highlighted items, the items that have changed since the original version. I did want to jump back um, to the severity levels, which are on proposed rule page five, um, because uh, we have heard some feedback from you all that you have questions and concerns about the addition of severity levels. So I wanted to take a few minutes to explain why we have not given that the package, and I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, so originally, we um, the, the way that we came up with these proposed rules is the department staff met with our county partners through what we call the APS Task Group. It's a representative group of um, APS um, caseworkers, supervisors, administrators from across the state, and we had not um, drafted severity levels into this. However, once we started sort of talking through what this due process would look like and what the caps check would look like, it became clear to us that it would be helpful to add that. And so some of the considerations and reasons why we proposed adding these. Um, one is that employer stakeholders had requested this, that they went out to the alliance and other groups of the providers, employers, and I guess the requires to conduct these tax checks. They asked us what information would be providing us when there is a hit or a match with the APS data system. 
And so we explained that on the child welfare side and what you'll see in packet three is that we're proposing that we would provide to them um, the county in which the finding was made, the date of the finding, the type of mistreatment, um, and that basic information. And what they said was, so all you're going to say it was physical abuse or caretaker neglect. Um, how will we have any context of you know, the severity of that? And so when we looked at the child welfare um, process, they do have severity levels in that program. And so we talked with our county partners um, and kind of came up with these definitions of severity levels, tailored what we saw in the child welfare system to what makes sense for APS, and um, came up with these draft definitions. Um, we also worked with our county partners to come up with some guidelines and some examples and parameters of what those would look like. So that's not necessarily something that we would include in rule, but we do have drafts of that that we're finalizing that would, we would then do training and technical assistance and provide documents to provide a framework and guidance. So for example, for a minor incident of physical abuse, these are the types of things you would look for and an example of that. For um, a moderate example of physical abuse, here's what that would look like. For a severe, here's what that would look like. So that would be more on the training side and on our more guidance and our policy level process. Um, so that was the key reason why we had included this. In addition to that, when we started thinking through the due process, um, we found that it would also be helpful as one of the factors that's considered in the settlement process, um, that it wouldn't be the only factor, um, but it would be potentially a factor that could help uh, the folks doing the appeals and care shot, you know, in that settlement process. Um, and so for those two reasons, and then there was sort of an added most bonus, if you will, of adding severity levels is that APS caseworkers currently do have a conversation when somebody is substantiated with, with that with substantiated perpetrator. Um, but starting July 1st, if these rules go through, they we will also be sending a notice. So every person substantiated in APS will receive a notice that says you've been identified as substantiated in the finding, provide all the information, here's how you can appeal. And so we thought, well, it might be helpful for the person who's been substantiated and also for the caseworker that is interacting with that person if there was more a distinction between minor, moderate, and severe. Um, so if you, you know, think, of, think of yourself as a person who's been substantiated in a death case and you get this letter that just says you've been you know, identified as having a finding, that's one thing. If you had known you'd done something relatively minor and that wasn't on there, you know, that could be difficult. If it was something minor and there was a, you know, indicator that it was a minor, established as a minor, that might be a different story. And what we heard from caseworkers is that on the child, you know, those that did both child welfare and APS, they've said that on the child welfare side, that also makes it easier to collaborate with the person who's been substantiated to, you know, get protective services in place and work with them collaboratively. Um, but if it was something relatively minor, having that distinction um, really helps them put services in place and work with that person. So that, that's kind of the, the rationale and reasoning why we did choose to leave this in. Um, but I would open it up for any questions of us or discussion that you think want to have on it. Mr. Chair, um, I, I think it's interesting, and I just want you to speak a little bit to the fact that the minor, moderate, or severe is determined by the outcome to the individual, the victim, or what you would call that person, as opposed to the level of misconduct. So the miscon mistreatment stays the same in all these. It's just what happens, right? So to me, it feels like the level would actually be more impacted by what is the level of neglect or abuse, no matter what happened to the person? Does that make any sense? Ms. That question? Ms. Rogers, if you wouldn't mind coming to the table and introducing yourself, if you're part of the team answering questions. Yes, good morning. This is Peg Rogers. I'm the program manager for the Adult Services Program. 
So um, to answer that question, I think there, there are kind of levels of mistreatment. And um, here can give some examples as well. <coughs> but for instance, um, if you had um, a care provider and you had a, a resident of a facility that kind of wandered away, they didn't get hurt, they were found right away, that could be minor. They wandered away, weren't located right away, and it was they were out on the street for hours, that could be moderate. If something occurred to them and hurt them while they were out, that could be severe. Here you may have some other examples as well. The example that, yes, excuse me. Um, this is care control manager um, with the administrative review division. Um, the example that came to mind is very similar on the child welfare side, and that would be lack of supervision of a toddler, for example, who gets out of the home, um, wanders down the street, someone finds them, and they're brought back home unharmed. Um, the same type of thing if they wander out of the home and then are potentially um, hit by a car, then there's different impact to the child, um, and, and that could be a more severe type of finding. If that makes sense to me, it just seems like there'd be a difference between, I just, I mean, I'm, I know you were debating whether to leave this in or not, and I'm talking about something that would be even more specific, but so probably adding to it, and we don't need to do that today, but it just feels to me like the person has done the same thing, the, the perpetrator or the person that's caused this neglect has done the same thing. If they look away and a toddler goes, then it's what happens. It's like a coincidence what happens to the kiddo. It's very serious. But that didn't change the perpetrator's behavior. If the perpetrator is looked away and the toddler left, that's very different than if the perpetrator was on drugs and was not ever paying attention to, and that was happening every day. And that's why I that's why it's hard. I would like for you to be able to make, even if the toddler went away and nothing bad happened at all, if you came back to the home and the person was on heroin, it's a much different level of now mistreatment. Ms. Kemp, I mean, uh, Ms. Rogers, Ms. Kroll, Mr. Wester. So, uh, this is Peg Rogers. That's kind of, you're, you're talking kind of exactly why the severity levels are there, right? Someone that looks away and the toddler is gone versus somebody that's on drugs and they're nodding off and, and something like that, right? So then you've got more severe caretaker issues. Another example would be um, if you have someone who's in a wheelchair and they're in an electric wheelchair and they can't, they can't ambulate any other way. Um, if a caretaker was to put them in a room and unplug their batteries, so they can't get out and they walk in the room for the afternoon. That's physical abuse by our definition. It's unreasonable confinement. If that that would be minor, they left them in the chair, nothing else occurred. If they happened to fall out of their chair because they were trying to hook that battery back up so they could get out, at that point then there's some injury there. They fell out of the chair, they may have laid on the floor for a while. Now we're looking at moderate. If they left them in that chair overnight, they soiled themselves, got all these other things, now we're looking at more severe. I just thought I'd add a legal perspective to your question. It's a very interesting question. Actually, it's very interesting from a philosophy of law standpoint, but I won't get into that. Um, <laughs> the statute does have a similar orientation towards the harm towards the adults. So uh, mistreatment is defined as behavior that exposes or threatens the health, safety, or welfare of the of the adult. And so the structuring the rules with this way is in alignment with the statute. Why the statute and the rules both focus on that is a really interesting policy question, but um, a couple perspectives. Uh, the harm to the adult is often easier to evaluate than the intentions or the culpability of the person's state of mind. So. You could have a caretaker who absolutely loathes uh, the person that they're taking care of, but treats them wonderfully well and protects them from all harm. That's not culpable and shouldn't be culpable. But you could also have a person who is you know, delighted to care for um, an at-risk adult and just fails at their job, and that is culpable. Mr. Johnson, what I think I hear Chris saying is <clears throat> it's the exposure to harm 
that a prospective future employer would want to know about. And Chris is saying, let's say this person exposes a person under their care to harm repeatedly, but it just so happens, fortunately, nothing bad happens to that person. That is maybe going to be minor, or maybe not even show up, whereas that is something that a prospective future employer would want to know. I don't know how to word that. And you're right, how do you discover, if nothing happens, how do you discover that, that the exposure happened? If not, if, if not treatment is exposure to harm, that doesn't necessarily mean any harm's been inflicted, right? Maybe that's what, I think that's what I hear Chris saying, which is a good point, but I don't know how to make it any more clear than more specific than it is here. Which I think it would be nice if you could. Which was So I think, uh, thank you, of what Mr. Johnson just said is actually captured into severity levels because there's an or that talks about changes to the client's health, safety, welfare, and finances. And I think there's flexibility in those of saying the welfare has been changed or compromised um, by high risk neglect, even though it didn't result in harm, or repeated neglect, even though it didn't result in the same level of harm. So I, I, I'm comfortable that the repetition or risk of harm is somehow met, measured, and captured. I'm it's also comfortable, especially because we're trying to figure out if it's in line with the statute. So Mr. McCombs, um, I don't believe the originating statute here contemplated levels, or do I have that wrong? It doesn't. Uh, it's silent one way or another. Thank you. I'm struggling with with, the, with these levels as I as I think I made clear the last time we all got together. Um, notwithstanding the or and whether or not in fact that makes it abundantly clear to a caseworker who is ultimately going to need to make this call, none of the definitions contemplate repeated or or one off episodes. And if Frogger comes to mind, so everybody has to forgive me. But you're running through traffic, and you're running through traffic, and a truck comes along faster than you're expecting, and a splat happens. So I have a responsibility to monitor a person, a human, for whatever reason. And, and in full disclosure, I know enough about I think I know enough about the system of supports for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to speak somewhat coherently to them. There's this thing called line of sight supervision. That means that if, if I'm working with Mark, line of sight means line of sight. It means that if I need to go into the kitchen to get a cup of coffee, I say, hey Mark, come with me, let's go get a cup of coffee. I can't turn around even if I think it's going to take 15 seconds and leave Mark outside of line of sight. The, the second I do, the nanosecond I do, that's mystery. And it doesn't matter whether he leaves the house and gets splattered by the truck moving fast. He is exposed. I, I, I view the, len the, the universe through, through the lens of, of binary code. Right? It either happens or it doesn't. And I think we're... I think we're parsing here in such a way that it leaves far too much discretion to different counties who have different access to different resources. Um, and this is part of the county system that we like, in fact, um, so that folks can make decisions that are, that are contemplated of their community. I'm telling you, this, this, this rating system is, I have great concerns about this rating system because what looks mild or moderate in El Paso County um, might in fact in Adams County look severe. And are we prepared as a system, as a state, as a, as a community to allow for that kind of discretion um, and, and these sorts of labels to be applied. So that, that's sort of my thing. I appreciate the question because I think you're onto something. I think it ought to contemplate clearly if, we're, if, if, if the department and the stakeholders and the community say these levels are essential, then it, it occurs to me that we have got to be unbelievably precise as to their definition so that they are evenly applied irrespective of where that county worker happens to work. Ms. Kemp. 
Um, one of the things that during our conversations with county partners about this, um, we struggled with and we kind of lost sight when we started diving into the severity level and thinking about that is that um, the, the, this is based on substantiated findings. So there's a piece that happens before they would um, potentially develop a severity level, and that is, you know, based on a preponderance of evidence, whether or not this happened, whether it was caretaker neglect or physical abuse. Um, and so these are only applied to substantiated findings. So all the piece around the investigation, the information that goes into making that conclusion would have already happened by the time um, they're distinguishing, you know, based on that substantiated finding, what severity level would be. Which was more simple? I will share with you that I believe that the enforcement of state criminal laws and prosecution of violations of those vary across the state. And you can write the law the best you can to try and get even applicability, but that may not be a reality, and I think there are limitations that um, when you write rules, you do the best you can, knowing that they may not be um, in, enforced the same way across any jurisdiction. Other comments or questions on Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate Commissioner Westerberg's uh, comments because I, I agree, and I think that um, you know this is the binary uh, in, in this case, right? And having those levels, having at least three levels. At first, I was not a proponent of having the levels, but I think I've been converted over based on your your uh, testimony here. Um, so I appreciate it, and I, I think it's important for us to create a framework where, um, you know, our priority is to protect uh, the individual uh, who is uh, at risk, but then also to um, create reasonable measures for people to be held accountable. So, so. Other questions? <coughs> Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so those are the um, primary areas in the beginning of the World packet. It pertained to either feedback we received from stakeholders or feedback um, from you from the February meeting that um, we wanted to highlight. The next section um, begins on proposed rule page 16, which is um, 30.910. And this will last for five or six, seven pages. Um, pertains to the whole process. Um, we do have, um, I know you all probably received this, but we do have a bigger one in case you want to look at that. And so we had um, developed this flow chart to kind of describe what is in here. Um, we wanted to make it clear that this is based on the version that you have today. So if you were to adopt it in specific language just in section 9 today, this is what it would look like in a closed Um At this time, what I thought might be prudent is rather than us walking through all of these seven pages, if you have specific questions, um, Kara Cole has worked on the child welfare side of the due process for a long time and will be involved with the due process for APS um, so she can answer questions. Mr. Bush, thank you. Um, this is a lot of stuff, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, I, I I went through a bit of a process trying to get my mind around it. Um, I suspect you can get as many definitions of due process as there are attorneys' licenses in practice law in Colorado, <laughs> um, but I think they have a couple of common elements. One is that there is timely notice and an opportunity to be heard, and that the extent of the hearing involved vary with the extent of the rights that are being protected. Those are kind of the three things I could find in, in doing some research. So I, I reread this with that in mind. And, and at the end of the day, I have really only one concern, and that is whether the notice 
that that this has been substantiated is not given, in my view, as timely to the alleged perpetrator as due process may require. Um, and I'm not going to be able to find find it where it is in, in the rules, but I believe it's within 10 days. That strikes me as considerably too long when you are talking about, you know, could be a family relationship, could be any type of thing. And I, I'm wondering, how did we derive that slow of a notice. And if I can amend Mr. Pusher's question to add another element that's in your answer, if you could respond to it. Is there something that in statute or existing rule that precludes that alleged perpetrator, notwithstanding a substantiation, to be in fact advised that they, formally that they are in fact the target of an investigation into mystery? If I may yeah. offer that friendly that, amendment to your question. Ms. Kemp? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, two questions there. Um, the first one I'll, I'll address um, is there's nothing in the rule or statute that um, requires the department or the county has to notify somebody when a case has been opened and they are the alleged perpetrator. So currently there is nothing in the statute uh, or rule for that. Um, and then to answer the second question, in terms of the 10 calendar days, this is a, one of the maybe two or three areas that we did, um, did not copy the child welfare statute. So currently there is actually no time frame, or there's no time frame in the child welfare rules for when the county needs to notify the substantiated perpetrator that they've been substantiated. We did add a time frame with that 10 calendar days in here because we thought, well, if we just left it open, they could do it two months later, so we should put a time frame. We arrived at 10 days um, as we were having discussions with our county partners because we had originally proposed five days to them and they said, well, what if Monday is a holiday, our worker is off on Friday, the supervisor approves the finding on Thursday, but then five days would be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. They're not back until Tuesday. Say so they were out sick on Tuesday. You know, to actually mail the notification and send it to the substantiated perpetrator, they would have missed that five-day time period. So to be honest, it was really um, in response to counties requesting the flexibility to have a little more time that they would, you know, try to send it out as soon as possible after the finding was approved by the supervisor. But for those extenuating circumstances where, for whatever reason, they weren't actually able to get it in the mail um, once the finding was approved by the supervisor, um, they requested that we put those 10 days. If I uh, may also let, just to confirm what uh, Ms. Kemp said, I heard from a county in my area that their, their only comment about this was their concern about being able to comply even with the 10 days given that some counties have um, one person doing child protection and adult protection, that when it comes to notification of something like this, it might have to go backseat to an actual uh, child protection case. As an example, most counties have more child protection issues than they have adult protection. So um, that was a concern that was expressed to me. And um, also, actually, your component about notice on the front end, um, it is, I would venture to say, and please anyone correct me with different information that they have, but it is, it would be the odd situation um, under Colorado law where there's a requirement to notify someone that they're under investigation, whether it's for uh, some kind of criminal conduct or whether you're having your uh, whether someone's reported unethical con uh, reported in my case I can speak specifically action on my uh, law license when there was a you know someone co uh, contacted the attorney conduct division and filed a complaint well they don't tell you that up front um, it allows for screening out of the things that really are frivolous or were not based in fact without necessarily uh, a Putting someone on the defensive, I think there's value in that, but it would be it would be rare 
or maybe not even existent that you notify someone under investigation for misconduct that, um, that they were under that investigation. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Arsenor. Uh, my experience um, is a little different to that, and that is that at least historically, as Rogers will surely correct me, because I'll go wrong on a certain thing. But, uh, historically, and again in full disclosure, I work for a community center board. And historically, community center boards have had jurisdictions for investigations into mistreatment, abuse, neglect, and exploitation. To some degree, some of that jurisdiction remains even after uh, 1284 and then subsequently Senate Bill 109 that, that have sort of combined to create this framework. And in fact, it was an obligation of ours to um, de facto, in essence, notify the target of the investigation as the alleged perpetrator, if for no other reason than to um, act to immediately protect the alleged victim. So the, 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 the situation was you err on the side of caution by way of victim protection versus not notifying the alleged perpetrator and potentially on the exact opposite side of that coin that you just offered, and I, and I appreciate that, leaving someone who is in fact guilty um, right next to a vulnerable adult who, in my world, happens to have an intellectual disability. And so um, we, in fact, notify the alleged target or the alleged perpetrator, uh, using this language, um, in order to remove the potential victim and potentially other victims from that perpetrator's head. And so in that case, it was de facto a notification. So my question is, even if it's just for that purpose, why? why Forgetting about what precedent is or isn't, why wouldn't we do that? Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a couple things. Um, it's not that the county APS program could not notify or should not. Um, it's silent on the rules and statute are silent on this. So in cases where it's necessary to notify the alleged perpetrator or, for example, to remove somebody from a situation and then the alleged perpetrator would end up finding out or knowing that there was an APS case involved, um, you know, that would happen. Um, but it's not required. Um, so I think that's a little bit of the distinction. And the other distinction is that in a case of a CCB or even a nursing home conducting an investigation on the treatment that occurred within their facility, they have an obligation to take administrative action and proceed in, in that way, and as part of that, the alleged perpetrator would find out that you can have administrative leave. Or, um, but in an APS case, where we're um, kind of going and conducting an outside objective investigation, um, sometimes or oftentimes it's not actually necessary to notify that person up front in order to you know, pro provide protective services or those sorts of things. I've been thinking about your response regarding the 10 days, and I want to go back to that again if I could. If on July 1, I am, on July 1, charges against me have been substantiated, and July 11th, the department sends out the notice, but I don't receive it until July 15. In those 15 days, I apply for a job at a competing care facility. What will they be told? Ms. Kim? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to defer to Ms. Rogers on that. Ms. Rogers? Um, so the rules, um, the rules state that while the appeal is going on, that is still reportable to the employer. So, um, so I can be disqualified from a job opportunity, but not have yet been notified of the charges against me. That's right. Not received that. That really bothers me. I wonder whether we aren't creating a due process claim that would be very hard to do. That's right. So technically that could happen in that short span, that could happen, but the, um, the substantiated perpetrator 
could let that employer know it's under appeal. The employer can then make a decision about that. Karen, you may have something. Ms. Kroll, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I mean, just in response to that, I think that what often happens is that the uh, person that is substantiated for the abuse, neglect, or exploitation has been notified. There's typically been a conversation. Um, I can speak from my experience in the child welfare side, um, since that's where my experience is. Um, typically, that person has been notified. There's been conversations. They may have been interviewed as part of the investigation or assessment. Um, this particular part of rule specifically talking about the written notification that's sent to them. So usually they're aware that that has happened. Um, not always, but usually they're aware that that has happened. And this is talking about the written notification that they would actually receive with written instructions on what their appeal process um, rights are, who they would contact, how they would um, file for those appeals. I, I understand. It yeah. still makes me quite nervous. Sure. Uh, Mark Wester uh, with CDHS. Uh, I was wondering, Mr. McCombs, could you speak to the due process and including timeliness that uh, uh, Mr. Busher is talking about and, and perhaps kind of um, give us a context of where this language came from? Sure. Um, so just to give everybody the context that Mr. Busher already enjoys, and I'm sure Commissioner Westendorf does also, due process, um, this will be a very brief constitutional law lecture, um, due process is evaluated uh, along a three-factor test developed by the U.S. Supreme Court in Matthews v. Eldridge. And the three factors are what's the individual's interest, what's the state's interest, and how do you balance those two together? I think that's a good framework for everybody to be aware of, including stakeholders who want to testify so that they can address these factors as well. So the first factor, the individual's interest, this is the interest of the substantiated perpetrator or substantiated individual at this point. That's a liberty interest, it's not a property interest. So we're not taking money away from them, but we are attaching a label that interferes with their ability to um, get the job that they want. And that's analyzed as a liberty interest. The interest of the state is, you know, is there an important governmental interest in doing this exercise? And we've heard testimony that that interest is making sure that people who have um, mistreated at-risk adults don't go through this revolving door into new facilities and, and uh, perpetrate on more people. Um, and that's been supported as an important government interest, and I think everybody in the room agrees on that. And then the, the real action happens in that third factor. How do we balance these things together? And that involves some law, but really a lot of policy. Um, and the courts will look at, when they're looking at that third factor, they'll look at things like, um, what are the administrative resources that we have to bring to this uh, question? What are the limitations on uh, the ALJs, on the agency staff? Um, how important? It's less a question of how important these interests are, like trying to pit them against each other and, and rate which one is more important than the other, but really, how do we calibrate the trade offs that they inevitably require? So, you know, they're going to be adverse to some extent. How do we um, make those, uh, those hard calls between which interest prevails at any one moment? So one of the big questions that often comes up is, do you put due process on the front end or on the back end? Do you do, um, so in this case, do you have the, all the hearing and due process before they are listed in CAPS or afterwards? And that's, um, I think a couple of meetings ago, I mentioned the Watso case. The reason I mentioned that is because they looked at a very similar question in the child welfare context of when you have, uh, when you have a system like this, does the hearing have to go before they're listed in trails or after they're listed in trails? And they affirmed that it could be listed after, they could be listed in trails even before they ask, which I think equally apply here. Um, they looked at the fact that the liberty interest is somewhat mitigated by the fact that it's a confidential database that's only accessible through background checks. So it would be very different if uh, the Department of Social Services at that time were publishing this list for the public to see 
versus keeping it in a database that um, is only accessible through background checks. Um, the fact that it's not limiting um, individuals listed from any profession, only certain professions. Granted, they're chosen profession, and that's not to be discounted, but um, it's not barring them from any work, for example. Um, they looked at the fact that there had been a previous investigation. So this is not like going out on the street and, hey, David, you're in, you're in caps now. It's after there's been an investigation, it's been reviewed by a supervisor. Um, there's an administrative review, review mechanism at CAMDERS to, uh, to QC that um, those findings to some extent uh, resolve cases before they have to go to hearing. Um, the, they looked at the need for prompt hiring decisions. So if you're in the position of a future employer, can it's basically a policy decision for this board to make, but would you rather have a long-term care facility hire someone who turns out to um, have committed abuse and that substantiation is affirmed, or would you rather have a long-term care facility hire someone or refuse to hire someone who's later exonerated? Both of those are bad results, you know, the false positive or the false negative. But which one is worse? Um, and that's a policy decision that this board can make. Um, and then finally, they also look at the extensive procedures that happen when the due process does happen. So the, the fact that it's in front of an impartial ALJ, that there's, you know, it's governed by the rules of evidence, they can call witnesses, they... Uh, you know, the extent of that process was also a factor that the Watso case looked at. So I think the reason I went into so much detail about Watso is I think this board, even though not all of you are lawyers, certainly has the expertise and the policy vision to look at each of those and see how they come out here. Now, in a, in a, um, a question about notice um, that Mr. Buster identified, you look at the same, um, it, it's not something that the Watso case addressed, but you do a similar analysis. Of, you know, what's, uh, what's, the, what's the reality of these processes? What are the interests at stake? How do we balance the administrative constraints that an agency, uh, APS, faces against the risk that a person could be blindsided by a finding? Um, and unfortunately, there's, unfortunately or fortunately, there's no clear, you know, bright line law on that, but the law has given you these sort of tools to analyze that question with. Mr. Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and to be clear, I do not disagree with the fact that the database gives this information during the pendency. I think that's appropriate. Um, I am only concerned that 10-day delay in giving the notice to the person who is alleged to be a perpetrator uh, may, may not be may, may be too long. Is it possible that ridiculous question? Please forget. Is it possible that investigation could be conducted, the substantiation be the result of that investigation without talking to the owners perpetrator? Ms. Rogers. Yeah. Peg Rogers. Um, technically, yes, but rule requires that they talk to the alleged perpetrator as part of their investigation um, when appropriate and safe. So, for example, um, we have had alleged perpetrators who are extremely hostile toward government employees, have a large cache of weapons. Um, and so we're not sending social workers out to interview that alleged perpetrator unless they can get law enforcement to go with them. But there have been times even law enforcement has said, hey, I don't want to go and talk to this person. Um, so it, it does happen occasionally, but not often. Sometimes we do have a perpetrator. We're not sure who the perpetrator is, and like scams, or it could be a um, something, a situation that happened in facility and there's a number of different staff um, and so you would talk to all of them <coughs> for sure because you couldn't narrow it down from which of these three staff might have caused the 
the situation. And for and to kind of finish that out, by definition, if you had three people and couldn't figure it out, no one will rise to preponderance of the evidence. That would be yeah. Ms. Rogers. Okay, that would be correct. And so those would um, be inconclusive or unsubstantiated. <clears throat> Um, at this point, uh, I guess we'd like to ask, are there any other questions on the section 910? Um, the last several pages, we really appreciate you being willing to dive into this and do some homework ahead of time and um, trying to work through and understand all of this. Um, so it, at this point, it's, it's more um, a question of what questions do you have for us on this? Uh, just to help me understand the process, um, in 30, so this is page 16 of the proposed rule, um, 30.910A, is the uh, notification of the perpetrator the last direct involvement of the county uh, staff? After that, I assume their records are part of the rec uh, of the of the. Uh, appeal or what, whatever the next of the process, but they themselves are not responsible for anything else procedural. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's correct. Um, the, the county involvement in the appeal process, the only real involvement that they have after they make a finding is to send that notification. Um, but this you know, county level appeal process that we've built in here, it, um, the, the information that the substantiated perpetrator will receive will direct them to contact um, Karen's office with their appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Davidson. Thank you. Sure. Could you address the uh, uh, paper that was given to us by the Home Care Association with regards to? Uh, Well, with regards to the concerns that are in this paper. So let me just reflect, I think, that that paper contemplates Rule 3, Rule yeah. Package 3. Okay. And so I would strongly urge the department to take both that paper and the paper offered by Mr. Hernandez yeah. under advisement as you move in onward through this process. But, but thank you, sir. Other questions at this time? We do have witnesses signed up to testify. Okay. I have a couple, and I'm just I'm stealing to some degree from Mr. Tatton's testimony this morning. Um, Thank you. And unless there's something further from the department, I'd like to invite our witnesses up to testify. So thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Welch, Mr. Hernandez, please join us. This is redundant, redundant, but I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself again um, for the record and walk us through your testimony. Okay, my name is Maureen Welch, and I live in Arrico County. And uh, I'm going to speak specifically to Rule Package 2 right now. <clears throat> uh, confidentiality, I think, is something that we need to seriously look at. Um, I was at an aging adult subpack meeting yesterday, and uh, toward the end of the meeting, some of the uh, individuals there said that there's a lot of issues around confidentiality being violated in multiple <coughs> counties. And um, Ms. Peg Rogers admitted that um, there are lots of cases that she knows of and that they're going to address in quarterly training. So I know that we can talk about your failure liability, but my concern is that <clears throat> I've worked as a special ed teacher, I'm working as a CNA, I understand confidentiality. And if APS workers in the state don't understand that concept, it's greatly concerning to me that they're going to be able to have the judgment to look at severity levels, to be um, responsible. 
I just, it really called into question every set anxiety that I mentioned earlier in my other testimony. So um, I really would like to know more about what's actually going on at the counties, but oh, all of that is behind the veil, so I don't know what really goes on there. Um, also, the APS task group was canceled both in March and April, so I don't know what they're working on there. Um, but uh, exceeding statutory authority, I'm holding on to this from my earlier testimony because it pertained to Rule Packet 2. Um, the severity levels do exceed um, the statutory authority of House Bill 17, 1284. Um, yes, it might reflect child welfare, but we're not creating a child welfare packet here. And um, I believe it was either Ms. Rule or Ms. Chanel who said if something doesn't work, we don't always want to recreate the wheel, but sometimes we have to. Um, and I think uh, in this case, maybe we don't look to child welfare to create the rules for adult protective services. So um, I suggest that we uh, cut out of this uh, rule pack at the severity levels completely. It's too subjective. Um, I don't know what the interracial liability will be there. If individuals can't even keep confidentiality at the county level. How can I trust them to actually use a rubric that we give them at a training? Uh, right now they have five days of training. And I guess they're determining uh, capacity. They're determining, uh, now they're going to look at Severity levels. I don't know what else we're going to put on these investigators that affect lives. And we can talk about, oh, there's 20,000 at the beginning of the funnel, and then there's this many at the end. But these are lives we're talking about. These are individuals with liberties, families, people that love them are being affected. So I think even one of those numbers is really important to take. So I really appreciate the rich, thoughtful dialogue here today. I've gotten a lot out of it. Uh, preponderance is not defined in state statute. It is defined in jury instructions. You mentioned that. Um, the state Supreme Court issues those. Can that be added to the rules? Why do we have to guess where it is and have people talk and come up? Can't we just put it in there, plain and simple, under the definitions? I don't understand why we can't put the definition of a preponderance of evidence into the rules. So I uh, don't think we can base substantiation off of something that isn't even defined. If the entire substantiation process is based on a preponderance of evidence and it's not clear who is defining it and how it's being applied, how can this entire existence of APS exist? And then my last uh, topic or area of topic is section 30.910, notice or notification. Um, the lack of notification at the start of investigation I think that some of the discussion today reflected back to child welfare, but I'm not sure you're aware of it, but at least for IDD individuals, which uh, Mr. Chair works with substantially, um, it's important that we realize that not one person is being accused in these cases around IDD individuals. Okay, they drag in the day program, they drag in the residential agency, they drag in the, um, the direct service providers. So around one individual who may have signs of abuse, neglect, uh, exploitation, or self-neglect, you can have actually eight to ten people involved in an investigation. So I think notification is a really big thing. I think in the provider community there's a lot of fear around not having the information and whether I should even stay in this field. I know a couple people have left the field. They're not going to provide services anymore because there's too many question marks about what's happening and everything is a secret. Um, also, there's not a clear number of days in which a case will be closed. This is extremely concerning to me. I know a couple of cases, families that have reached out to me, where it's more than six months. They have no idea where their case is at. They don't know if they're close to determining substantiation or not. They don't know if they're close to losing, um, that individual losing their guardianship and being taken over by um, APS. They have no idea. And that's the thing, is it's the not knowing that is really concerning to me. So it would be really great to have more guardrails. Right now we have an open process. Oh, the investigation is open. The case is open. Um, what does that mean? How many days? What, when will I know? Who's going to tell me? Will it be the county? Will it be the state? All of these things are undefined because the rights aren't given to individuals that are under uh, investigation at the beginning. There's no right sheet saying this is how it's going to happen. Within 10 days you'll know this. Within 30 days you'll know this. Within 60 days. And then once the substantiation is found, you'll know 10 days after. None of that is given to individuals under investigation, and that's very concerning to me. And then uh, the only time notification is made by rule is for substantiated persons. And please, please, we need to strike that perpetrator rule from, uh, perpetrator term from all the rules because it's, uh, it's a judicial term, it's not an administrative term. And the last one is there is a financial incentive, I'm not sure 
Uh, I went to uh, the sub pack and the full pack yesterday, and I looked at the allocations and how the counties get funded, which was fascinating as a taxpayer. And I didn't realize that APS has a financial incentive to get guardianship and keeps guardianship because that individual counts towards their caseload, and that counts toward their increased funding. So I think that when we look at keeping a case open because of APS having guardianship, whether it's emergency or ongoing, they actually are feeding themselves. And I think that those financial things, I always tell people, follow the money, because a lot of answers come there. So we need to make sure that there's some guardrails on that. Are people going after uh, guardianship to increase their department size? I think that's it for now. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, on any questions for this book? Well? So thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hernandez, one more introduction for the record. Yes, um, Rob Hernandez, thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you, members of the board. Um, and I don't know how many attorneys are in the room, like counting one, two, three, four altogether. I just want to make sure, because I was a juror two weeks ago, and the judge thoroughly walked us through the levels of preponderance. You know, but if you were going to make, when you were sitting there as a finder of fact, and he was very clear when they're doing jury selection and we got our jury instructions, he was very thorough, and he said, that man sitting over there is innocent. And you have to understand that if you are going to sit on this jury, I need to know, and, the, and both sides asked, are you, as a finder of fact, are you going to listen to both sides? And of course, if you, you, and if you were trying a case, what, whatever side you're on, you want jurors to say, yes, I will listen to both sides because you want them to be weighers of fact. What, what, what's the determination? So not only did the judge define what beyond a reasonable doubt meant, um, the defense did, and so did the <coughs> prosecution. They defined it. They walked it through, and they all said, that man over there is innocent. Just because he has charges against him does not mean he is guilty. Well, I was sitting next to, uh, during the jury selection process, I was sitting next to another prospective juror who said, well, he wouldn't get his fault if there wasn't something wrong. I said, no, 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 that, that's not fair. You have to be fair-minded. You have to listen to the evidence. You have to listen to testimony. You have to listen to the witnesses. Is there hard evidence? What, what does it, and so the judge walked us through again, and he said to every single juror, finally when we got through, and it was interesting because they completely eliminated the front row. I don't know why they did. And I, was, I was number 12, and I thought, well, but, but, and you never know when you're going to get called. But that was my second time serving on a jury. Um, and so it, it's, it's the heartbeat of democracy serving on a jury. So when I hear jury instructions, having it been so fresh, and hear you discuss them, I know that the court system looks at these things very, very carefully. And so the question did come up, because as the judge walked through it, and he got to the part about preponderance of evidence, he said, I usually hear, hear that kind of cases in automobile accidents. Who was more guilty? Who, what, who, bore, the, who bore the weight more? Was it, was it who took the turn? And who was, who was more at fault? He said that generally falls for no fault in, in, or, or fault cases like in, in civil courses, in civil cases. So to hear that, to where you're going to take somebody's liberty and their, their choice to earn a living away, to me is going beyond that. You're really saying, well, you know, we're using the preponderance of evidence beyond a reasonable doubt in this particular case, but, you know, we're going to use a lower standard is what it's saying. And so if it's not a statute, which Representative Busher had asked about, because I don't see it in statute. And it may be a judicial standard, but it's not in statute. So I would, would just ask the board to be very, very careful with this as they go forward, because you want to make sure, as you had said earlier, you know, what's, what's the... Yeah, when, when you're trying to make those determinations, are you doing more harm than good? Are you doing more good than harm? And you're trying to weigh those kinds of things. So I would, I would advise, if... if uh, if I could make a motion, I would say, why don't we study this? Why don't we explore this more? Let's talk about this more. Let's. What, what does this really mean? You know, let's 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 bring out which, which justice said this. How did the rule come about? Let's let's explore this more before you just want to put it in rule. That 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 would be my recommendation. And then the severity level. I mean, that, that's the trouble with this whole process is that you are guilty until proven innocent. If ever, <coughs> that's the problem with it. So, so you stay in the CAPS registration, you know, in perpetuity. So as long as that CAPS registry is there, your notes about you are in there in perpetuity. So as long as computer systems exist, that will be passed down. You know, 20 generations from now, your family could get a court order and look to see what happened, you know, 200 years from now and see those notes if that, you know, if they follow the rules, if, if, this, if this is still around. 
So that's that's the determination you want to make. And so on the front end, there's no due process on the front end. So why wouldn't you want to let somebody know, wait a minute, you're under investigation. And so, wait a minute, you need to, the best thing is you need to get an attorney. You get an attorney, you sit down, but we heard Mr. Totten say, Senator Cook said, well, but the, uh, the, the individual who was doing the investigation said, uh, well, he had an attorney, so therefore he lost his credibility. Well, wait a minute. You know, doesn't everybody have a right to counsel? And correct me, correct me, counselors. Am I wrong? Quite a yeah, personal but, approach. Can you address the board yeah. and not the audience? Well, 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 yeah, but, but you kept referring to them, so that's why I'm, I'm pointing to them, because if you're using them as counsel to back up your statement, that's why I think it's important to bring that, bring these points up. So, um, but that's, that's, you know, it's the whole big picture, you know, as you're looking at this. So, you know, it, I just think that, that severity levels really aren't in statute. They probably shouldn't be there because you're already ensnared. You know, we hear, if, if, if there's an allegation made against you, how do you go through the process, the due process, before they get to this substantiation piece part? You should have a right to, that's a whole process in itself. Not after the fact, so then you try to figure out how do I, how do you make the determination that it didn't occur, well, that could be done during the process of the investigation. That's my point. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I want to talk about, you know, at the very bottom of the page, page 13, section, section 30.250, I asked that question. This isn't put in here, but my question was, if the Civil Rights Division... Mr. Andrews, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm on the bottom of page 13. Analysis page 13. Yeah, analysis page 13. Sorry, I want to make sure. Setting up the page 13. Yeah, analysis page 13. Yeah, analysis page 13. Please proceed. At the bottom of page 13, stakeholders requested an exception to confidentiality be added to compel release of APS case record for civil rights investigation. That wasn't, that wasn't the question. The question was, the Civil Rights Division has adjudicatory powers, unless the legislature changes that. So if they, if they put out a subpoena for these types of records, my understanding is that subpoena. That was the question. So I didn't say that an exception to confidentiality would be made. The subpoena is a subpoena. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Attorney. Mr. Tri Deputy Attorney General, but anybody that, because because they're judicatory powers, that they would have to disclose that. So, but with that, I just wanted to say, it, it, was, it was stated wrong. So there was no, nobody was asking for an exception. The question was about a subpoena. So, but having done that, I mean, you know, and then we get to, to the top of page 14. You know, when you're not letting somebody know that there's an investigation going on, what rights do they have? You're basically saying you don't have any rights. You know, there's there's no due process. Sixth Amendment, you know, doesn't matter. You know, and, and in some of the cases we're talking about, law enforcement has basically stepped back and said there's nothing here. So, uh, so I just want to make those notes is that is that you kind of go forward when you have use words like perpetrator, alleged perpetrator, proponents of evidence, uh, security levels. Um, those are things I think should be explored more. They could still continue down the road with what they're doing, but I would just ask that the board reconsider this, that there could be more exploration of these terms, what they mean, take a deeper dive into what they are, and not make such a, such a decision because I sense some degree of, well, we're really not sure, but do we want to, and I'm kind of doubting, but yeah, I thought about it, but, so that would be my recommendation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and there's questions for our witnesses? Thank you. Yeah. The department would mind rejoining us. Do we have someone on the phone who wanted to come over this Ms. Fernie, are you still with us? I thought I saw that she left us. Okay. Can you walk Yeah. And so I, I would, thank you, I appreciate us for pointing that out. She has submitted written testimony. Um, it is on your golden rod sheet in your place. If I can ask the department, Mr. Wester, Ms. Kemp, Ms. Rogers, Ms. Kroll. Okay. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Mr. Wester appears to be missing. We have a couple of questions. I believe this morning you shared with the board that three percent or fewer of Cases result. Sure. I strike my question uh, in classic legal fashion. How many times does APS take guardianship of a person? And 
The second part of that question is, how long could guardianship last? Ms. Kim? Ms. Rogers might have an answer for you. I'm going to give this shot and then... Ms. Rogers will correct you too. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to refer to my notes. Um, and so what we had shared this morning is in terms of specifics. Um, this right. So about 3% of all services, and so one person can get multiple services, but about 3% of all the services that are implemented as part of an APS case for the at-risk adults um, in fiscal <coughs> year 16-17 were without the client's consent, so involuntary. That's sort of the high level. That would include other things like voluntary hospitalization. <coughs> and then getting on to guardianship, um, the statistic that we had shared from our data is that in the last two fiscal years, so over two years, um, we provided services to over 14,000 at-risk adults, so that's a big group. Um, in just under 150 of those cases, or 1% of them, resulted in a guardianship. And then to further delineate that, um, only 15% of those uh, 15 specific cases, or one tenth of 1% 1 of the two, past two years, were for adults with IV. Does that answer your question, or do I need to refer to that? No, no, that answers it. Thank you. What? I'm sorry. What? what would the other be? They work for adults with IDD. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so that would be all other adults. Um, as, as you probably remember, the, the pie chart, going back to the pie chart of um, uh, the age. age. Okay. So that would be frail, elderly, older adults. Um, in 16 and 17, uh, thank you. Um, it was 1%, so thank you. That's very useful. In 16 and 17, would you anticipate there being an increasing number of cases uh, that involve an adult with an intellectual or developmental disability this current year than, than last year? Ms. Kim? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we have not seen a dramatic upward trend in counties petitioning and receiving guardianship for individuals with IDD. I think part of that is reflective of the fact that individuals with IDD represent 10%, roughly 10% of APS clients. So your typical APS client is a frail elderly person. And so um, we just have not seen a dramatic shift in those numbers. That's interesting. Thank you. And Mr. McCombs. I know that jury instructions don't carry the weight of law, but they're pretty darn uh, important. And we've heard a suggestion that that specific language, um, there is a definition, in fact, in the newest version of the rule proposed of preponderance, and we covered earlier that it does, in fact, find its origins in that Supreme Court, correct me any time I go off here, um, in that Supreme Court um, guidance, and it is consistent across different sections of not only DHS rule, but I think you also said other rules that you've at least reviewed that contemplate preponderance. Is there is there specific explicit language that could be used to, to detail it even in, in an even greater way? So the current language that's in the proposed rule is aligned with both other rules from this board, as well as the Supreme Court approved Colorado jury instructions. Judges in the course of a civil trial may give further jury instructions than what is approved by the Supreme Court as an illustration in, in particular facts of the case. So it is possible to add more language that fleshes out the concept of preponderance of the evidence. My expectation is that the more detail that goes into, the fewer cases it will cover. Um, so it stops being a general definition that county caseworkers can return to in every case and becomes um, a series of illustrative comments that may not fit the particular case they're working on. So um, that's a balance that's up to the board to strike. If, um, 
if you want more language developed, I think you can be confident that this language is at least the right place to begin and ask the, um, the department to explore further language, if that's in the board's interest. I'm going to make a kind of like I want to cover the five things that I've got listed. Please try to do them real quickly. Uh, on the issue of preponderance of the evidence, I think um, it is a term that is well enough known in the law that we should just leave that alone as it is. Um, secondly, uh, concern about the use of the word perpetrator. Uh, that bothers me also, but that is the word that is used in statute, and I think we are we're guided to use the same terminology. Um, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Pusher, if I may interrupt. I'm sorry, we're having Klein. the audio. Is it okay to take a quick break? We'll get the audio fixed. Um, yeah, we'll stand in a five-minute recess. And, and you break it back? An acquiescence to concerns about the word perpetrator, and I was going to interrupt you anyway to ask the department and or Mr. McCombs if in fact we're wedded to perpetrator. In my experience, and I don't know that it isn't colloquial, we've actually used the word target. Um, historically, in at least investigations, none of these words are happy words. And so, I don't know if there is some statutory sort of foundation for the use of the word perpetrator, in which case we stick with it, or if the department has a, has a position or an observation of uh, around other language that might be appropriate? Mr. Uh, Jones. I believe that perpetrator is um, coming from the statute. Uh, as I mentioned at our board retreat, when rule uses different language than statute, there's always an analysis to be done. Um, in this case, I see the risk mainly as one of confusion rather than actual violation of the law. So um, I think as long as there's an, a, a a robust definition of whatever language is used, that this is the same concept as what has perpetrated the statute. There should be no uh, risk that, for example, the Office of Legislative Legal Services would say that we departed from the law. Um, that said, you know, you'll, you would still have to look at the risk of confusion to administrative law judges, looking at different language and statute versus rule, um, the potential confusion of caseworkers doing the same. Um, Jared also, I guess, is. I think Mark's team can weigh. Mr. Westers team can weigh in on the administrative implications of overhauling rules to use different language. Uh, I know the child welfare rules does use the term perpetrator. It also uses at various stages um, person alleged to have committed abuse and neglect, person responsible for abuse and neglect, depending on on what stage the uh, the individual is in their legal process. Ms. I, yes, so I'll just kept call on this again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we have heard the feedback on the word perpetrator in the rules, um, and uh, Mr. McCombs has corrected there are uh, several references to both alleged perpetrator and then substantiated perpetrator throughout the rules. In addition to that, those are the terms that we use in all of our training, our written guidance and documentation to county APS staff. Um, so I would say that if we were to um, contemplate using a different language for that, um, that that's something that we would request um, some time to really think through, go back, um, review what other states do, for example, what other programs do, to do a thorough analysis um, and come back to you at some point in the future with recommendations on um, what changes could be made. Um, I don't think we're in a position today to make a determination on that. Um, in addition, we would like to check with you know, our county partners um, to get their feedback on that um, before making any kind of you know, changes. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm very good with that. Um, if, if the legislature changed and used language which is more common in other investigations, subject, target, and then you could use perpetrator, but without the legislature doing something, I'd be uncomfortable with, the, with our rules doing something. Um, like a couple of folks, I spent a lot of time trying to get my mind around the way we have defined, the way that we have used the, the results to the injured person 
as a component of defamation. Um, that does make me un uncomfortable, but I, I tried to figure out well, what, what would be the alternative. And the alternative would be to define something like careless, negligent, gross negligent, intentional, and maybe even a fifth level. And, and that seems to me to be even more fraught with peril. And so, as much as I don't quite like that, I think it's better than the alternative. And, and lastly, uh, well, the two last things I tried to determine is whether this rule is consistent with the direction in the statute. And I think it is. I don't, I don't find things in here that go beyond the direction to flesh out the statute. Um, and that leaves the last issue for me is whether this is adequate coverage of due process. And as counsel explained, due process can be, needs to be in some instances before and in some cases after, depending on the harm that you're trying to protect. Seems to me it's appropriate that due process happens here after the investigation. Um, I think generally the due process <coughs> laid out here is good. The only area that I have a concern is is in the 10-day notice. I've already discussed that. I will not vote against that, this rule, because of that. But I do want to express my concern that that, that may not be adequate notice. There's all my comments. Other questions or comments from members of the board? Commissioner Westendorf. So, uh, this is a question for the department. A couple of people, including uh, Ms. Crony, says that minors ages 11 to 17 uh, could be possible perpetrators. I didn't see that anywhere. Can, do you have any idea where that assertion comes from? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So that is part of Rule Packet 3. Um, and I don't know if I want to get into this right now, but just I by, by that think that's enough for me to know. Yeah. So um, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, there was a question about a deadline for um, uh, how long it takes to close a, uh, I, I believe the word was case, but really I think you're talking about an investigation as to whether someone becomes a substantiated perpetrator. Um, I, I can understand uh, not liking that limbo. I can understand uh, wanting that incentivizing counties to wrap that up and not unduly delay it is important. But would that for, would a person who believed they were uh, subject to this investigation have an opportunity to call the state and say uh, from the quality control side and say, hey, what? please put some pressure on these guys to clean, clean it up? Is there, what happens if it is on duly delayed? Mr. Chair, um, so a couple of things on that um, in, in terms of the, the timeline for conducting an investigation. In rule, there is a timeline on caseworkers must complete an investigation within 60 days. Um, and so and if I would say if an individual had reason to believe that the ABS case was open for longer than the required time frame or they had concerns about that, I would recommend initially they contact the, the local county to ask, you know, what, um, what is going on with this. Um, the, the county, due to confidentiality, may not be able to respond directly to them and give them details of the case or including the time frame or even that a case, you know, is open if they were a member of the public. Um, but they would be able to take that into consideration and recommend it. Um, the other thing is if they're not satisfied with the response at the county level, they always can call the state without any kind of complaint, including, you know, I'm concerned about a time frame of a case. And then I would also say that we do have mechanisms in place, um, both reports that we pull um, from our APS unit and then the, the CUA unit would be looking at different things potentially um, to ensure timeliness and consistency things like that. So we have various reports. Um, one that comes to mind is we have a report on activity on a case. So if there's been no movement on a case, nothing being added anywhere for a certain period of time, you know, we would reach out to the county. Um, so 
we have mechanisms to ensure that things keep moving. Thank you. If I could follow up with a couple of Please, Commissioner Weston Dorf. Um, and actually, I'm not too sure how much is questioned. I heard you say or comments, so I'm going to jump onto the or comments Please. part. And that is, uh, like Mr. Busher um, made a comment, comment specifically as to preponderance of the evidence. Um, I'm satisfied that's the correct standard. I'm satisfied that um, that that is adequately defined um, both here and in the, uh, the rest of the context of adult protective services. These are these caseworkers also will be taking cases to court occasionally where they have to prove to a judge to a certain standard of proof, and these aren't going to be totally incomprehensible to the on uh, caseworker. I don't believe, um, and then. Um, I also am satisfied with the severity levels, and I think they're an important component of this. Recognizing, recognizing there may be limitations on uh, how we break them up, and that there's pluses and minuses to any uh, uh, structure like this. But particularly from the employer standpoint, and this kind of ties to some comments in the public comment related regarding blacklisting people. Um, at the purpose of the, to me, the, one of the benefits of a severity level is that it doesn't blacklist. Any employer looking to hire somebody where they have some kind of background check of any kind needs to know what, what, were, the in, what were the circumstances of this incident because they're not all the same. It gives that employer an opportunity to inquire about in, the specifics of it, an incident. Um, and an initial review of application saying, how they can, how they can really, uh, who still may be qualified to, to, to be hired for the purposes. So, um, I'm satisfied with the severity levels, and I'm, I think that the input from the employers uh, shows this necessity. And then, um, I think lastly, is that um, I want to clarify some comments that came in through the uh, witness statements, and that is. Um, uh, at least my county has no financial incentive to try to get guardianships. Uh, you can follow the money from the state side, but it's not showing you the money from the county side. And guardianships do not make La Plata County any money. In fact, they cost La Plata County money. And um, they actually tend to be, uh, because of the, the ne typically never-ending um, uh, aspect of them. Most guardianships aren't terminated due to the person gaining capacity. They might be <coughs> passed on to someone else who's not the county, but most guardianships are terminated because the person passes away. That's a lifetime <coughs> And um, uh, so I just want folks who aren't county commissioners to, to be aware that this is not a money maker for us. And uh, that, that's it for me. It's rule. Um, I had a quick question about <coughs> the ombudsman was referenced earlier, mm -hmm. and is the use or access to ombudsman, um, the office of the ombudsman, is that limited to just someone who is at risk, and or or in this case where we're talking about someone who's um, a suspected perpetrator, can they also access the ombudsman for to? to um, assess where they're at or to get some type of assistance in dealing with a local county. Ms. Um, so the long-term care ombudsman, we actually at CDHS and the my division, um, we contract with disability law for this week. Long-term care ombudsman, and we also contract with the area agencies on aging, so the local ombudsman throughout the state. Um, and so the role of the ombudsman is um, their purview for the long-term care ombudsman is um, strictly facility based. So it's all individuals who are in a nursing home or assisted living. Mm -hmm. And their role specifically <coughs> in my area is our state long term care ombudsman. The way she describes it is they're intended to be the voice of, of the individual, um, so the you know, client, residents, that sort of thing. And so their role is um, to advocate on behalf of that individual. Um, so that's the extent of their name. Thank you. For the comments, Mr. McCombs. <coughs> Aside from the long term care on this one, though, counties and the state department of CDHS do have a complaints department that anyone can make a complaint to and those are followed up on. Ms. Kemp, 
some of the timelines are a little fuzzy. It's hard to follow the bouncing ball. We have three different rule packets that all combine. They're supposed to create a framework. Vulnerable adults. Um, there's a July 1 rollout. Of, there's a January 1 statutorily defined rollout of the CAPS system in all of its splendor. Is that correct? The process by which APS enters substantiated substantiations onto the CAPS system rolls out on July 1st of this year. Is that correct? Not exactly. <laughs> um, close, though. Yeah. So um, APS currently does enter substantiations in CAPS. That's already happening. Um, what we can't do is pre process until, until these rules are done. Okay. So, there's, so I'm thinking out loud. It occurs to me then that we are going to be uh, collecting information and experience data that we're not collecting right now around the application of due process in response to these substantiations being entered into the account system. Yes? A little bit. Okay. Sorry about the nuances. Um, so the, the real timeline issue is that um, the law statute requires that we cannot report information to employers without the people who are substantiated having due process. So the date that due, due process begins, which we're proposing July 1st, anything substantiated on or after that date, that is the information that will be reported to employers. So while we are currently collecting and tracking information on substantiated perpetrators and caps, that information cannot be reported to employers until that due process starts. Okay, and so that's just uh, Mr. Coates. Uh, and to put an underscore on that, that means that everybody who's in CAPS currently but has not been given due process, they get expunged. So it's a clean slate, July 1st. People going forward will have due process, and those substantiate and those new substantiations can be reported out in background checks. No one else before okay. that. Thank you, Mr. Combs. That's, that's where I'm heading. Um, so that as of July, well, between July 1st of this year and December 31st of this year, having now installed these due process rights, we will have collected information about everything from numbers of substantiations, how many perpetrators avail themselves of due process rights, what the outcomes of those due process rights will have been, and I hate to talk about it in terms of numbers, but if in 17 we had 14,000 um, I guess I'm talking about the possibility of a fairly substantial data set that we will amass between July 1st and December 31st of 18 as to the effectiveness or not of this process. Is that is that reasonable for me to assume, Ms. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we will be getting more information on how the due process rolls out by then. And, and I think the important thing to note is that um, if you were, for example, to start due process December 1st, starting January 1st when employers are requesting the checks, all they would be getting is the results of those substantiations. That's not the question I'm asking. I appreciate that observation because that's spot on, but that's not the question I'm just asking. What, I'm, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I think I might be getting at, however circuitously, is if we learn in October that the outcomes we envision now with respect to this rule is not, in fact, the outcomes that we are achieving, either because due process is not as robust as we hope it will be, or we're getting folks caught up in the system, um, who really ought not be caught up in the system, or a hundred possible outcomes. <coughs> Is the department prepared to take those data on in real time and make tweaks to this? So I'm sensitive to the concerns that are being expressed, and I need you to hear that. Um, 
it doesn't mean that I'm not satisfied that, that you haven't undertaken a, a, a good um, public input process, probably more than is typically the case. The, the topic is a hot topic, and I think rightly so. I'm glad people are ginned up about this, because we got to get this right. Um, I appreciate the fact that you're, that you're holding these sorts of stakeholder engagements. And I don't want good to be the enemy of the perfect. I fought, as I've exposed to this board several times over, very hard to have some sort of a system by which with only with fewer than 3% of perpetrators of abuse on people with intellectual disabilities ever facing criminal conviction, it's not okay. But I absolutely want to be sure that we don't inadvertently and unwittingly wrap up folks into a system that, that brands all of them similarly. <coughs> And so I want to know, I need to know, that the department is, is prepared to use these six months as a testing ground, as a beta test, to see if in fact it's doing as we want it to do, and if not, change it. Can you, can somebody talk me off the ledge, please? You, you bet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mark Wester here. Um, first of all, this is a new system. <laughs> Uh, we, it has experienced a lot of enhancement over the last several years and building up a very specific background type process. Um, these rules are designed to get us where there's protection for alleged uh, perpetrators or people who are alleged to have abused people. Uh, and then there's operational concerns beyond that. Our responsibility is to implement the the, the law as it is, and part of the rulemaking process is to evaluate over time. The, the reason, the helpful thing about rulemaking is that over time, as our experience as a department and as we operate this uh, statutorily driven process, it allows us to update and learn from that. I don't know, uh, David, if three months of data is enough to extrapolate what whether or not it's a good system or not, but over time, as we gather data and as we identify um, trends that may be problematic, we will address them at that time and we will update our rules accordingly. Is that a yes? Yes. <laughs> I'm so sure this wasn't. Other comments or questions at this time? I move the adoption of document number two, incorporating the single basis and purpose and specific statutory authority contained in the record. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Commissioner, thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Any abstentions? Thank you very much. And thank you very, very much indeed to our witnesses. <clears throat> there is more work to be done. Um, I hope you will stay engaged in the stakeholder process. Um, I appreciate the department's efforts, and I certainly appreciate the bank members of the board for their more than passing interest in this very, very difficult issue. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson, closing scrutiny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that all rules of office of the State Board of Human Services meet the criteria of the administrative procedure that are appropriated by reference. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Davidson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. same sign. We'll make session for April. Is it